It's 4 p.m. Stand up. It's count time. It's time for every man and woman to stand up and be kind. I'm Brother L.D. Ozober, and I'd like to welcome you to another edition of Count Time Podcast. Yes, I know it's one of these months. It's the month of October. It's October Fest, what we're going to call Tiger Fest. We got some special shows here this month. We got some special former players that's going to be sharing their history and their story. We got the one and only, D. Coach. Terry Robisky got a lot to share, and we want you to be a part of it, and we don't want you to miss any of these shows in the month of October, so please take your time and scroll down right now and hit the subscribe button. That way you can catch each show each week throughout this month and the months to come. Also, please like and share Count Time to all your friends and loved ones. Thank you once again, and we we're looking forward to you joining in each week into count time. And remember, man can shackle the hand, man can shackle the feet, but only you can shackle the mind. The mind is free to travel wherever you dare to take it. Welcome to another edition of Count Time Podcast. I have someone here that flew all the way from LA Los Angeles, California, to the big city. But unfortunately, for a reason that we don't, you know, we all kind of been not as expecting because we all have some big plans going on. Getting ready for this week, this, I mean, this year, what it is, 2023 football season. Well, to, make, to let you know, we got here the one and only, the great, the legendary, Terrence Joseph Robisky. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Count Time. Ain't no problem, man. I'm happy to be here. I'm, I'm, I'm glad we finally got together. You, uh, you've you been calling me a couple times and asking me to come down. And like you said, it's, it's a very unfortunate situation. We've lost one of our great teammates, one of our great love. Uh, it, it's a tough loss, you know, for all the LSU fans that knew Richard Roman. Know Richard is a great person. And um, unfortunately, I had to come down for that. But fortunately, it gives us a chance to get together, you and I, to sit and chat and uh, break bread together and, you know, have a sip of, I guess if we could have a glass of wine, nobody looking. <laughs> have a glass of little wine and talk about it, you know. We can locate some here. And also, yeah, we got so. your brother Nelson here today, Nelson Jones. Nelson, thank you for coming in and getting in here safe. And we appreciate that. And uh, But I really think we got here Coach Terry. Robiscuit. That's how everybody know him as Coach Terry Robiscuit. And man, we just, I'm just so appreciative. I first met you. No, no, no. I saw you at uh, when I came in 1976 to watch LSU as a recruit uh -huh. to yeah. watch LSU play. Yeah. And that's the game they must have gave you that ball a hundred times. <laughs> I, 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 you were yeah. working on breaking a record. Uh huh. Yeah. Every, man, yeah. every time I tell you, yeah. you know, at the time, you, you, it was interesting to watch you run your rap to, it just, they had that long neck, yeah. and you ran kind of yeah. straight up, you know, yeah. right? Yeah. It was interesting yeah. to watch you run, but I remember that, that, that night, they kept giving you the ball, kept yeah. giving you the ball. So, you broke a record that night. Yep, yeah. yep, yeah. it was a fun game, I think it was the Rice game, and uh, like you said, as, uh, that night, I think it was the Rice game, we broke the record, I broke the record for most, most rushing yards in a single game. And uh, I think that was the one, unless it was, well, it might have been the one when I broke the record for maybe the most first time y'all rushing in LSU. I don't know what record I, I it was. I don't know. 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 Back, as they would say, back in the day, I broke a lot of records. I so. <laughs> yeah, don't know which one that was. Don't know which one that I was. I mean, but they kept giving you the ball. You, yeah. I mean, a few times you laid on that ground yeah. for a But I, that's why I think it was the rush game. I think it was I think it was the rice game. It was the game I think I had 215 yard rushing in. We, like you said, is we just decided we was going to pound the ball and we are going to pound it against them and make a lot of plays. And they decided to give it to me and I decided to carry it. And then it just got to the point like, whoa, now give, give me a little break here. I'm running out of gas. You know I mean? <laughs> but it was fun and we had a great time. And I remember you coming in on your recruiting trip and uh, you were highly, highly recruited. A lot of guys was talking about you. A lot of the defensive coaches obviously wanted you. And uh, I was very instrumental back then, being, uh, being the guy that had come into LSU that was, quote, unquote, uh, at that time, the number one recruit 
in high school, in all the high school football, the number one recruit in the United States. Number one States, recruit. Number in, out, of Ag Agar, out of Agar, Louisiana. Agar, Louisiana, the number one recruit in the country. It, it, no, first of all, yes. tell people where Agar, Louisiana is. Well, that's, that, well, let me tell people this. Now, if i got to tell you where Edgar is, you won't know nothing about history. Because right? I'm telling you, Edgar, Louisiana is where it's at. Now, where is it? Well, no, to be honest with you, we are literally, we tell people we're about 18 miles on this side, uh, about 18 miles on this side of New Orleans. We're on the bayou. We live on the bayou. The bayou is in front of us and the Mississippi River is behind us. It's the greatest little town in America. I mean, it's unbelievable. Uh, Today, I don't know what it is. Today is eight, 900 people. You know, like, listen, we don't have stop signs. We don't have red lights. We don't have grocery stores. We don't have a post office, policemen. We have none of that. But if you went there tomorrow, don't have you, we don't have policemen. We don't need them. We know, everybody knows everybody in my hometown. Everybody loves everybody in my hometown. We have a blast. And uh, like I said, there's no stranger. If you go down there tomorrow morning, my brother could tell you, Nelson will tell you himself, you walk in, just knock on the door, Terry sent me. Come on in, sit down, take your shoes off. What do you want to eat? And, okay. and we start eating and cooking. Whether we eat crawfish, catfish, uh, alligator, red bean and rice, it don't matter. It's on the table. Let's eat. Everybody sit down and eat. Make love. Yeah, and that's what it's all about, man. We love people. We love meeting people. And we enjoy loving people. You know, and that's, that's my hometown. But like you said, at that particular time, in 1973, I'm the number one recruit in the nation. And I've got an opportunity. I've got phone I mean, calls. I mean, but just think, you from a little small town. Little town. <clears throat> that people time. got at that time you you could you there was a road in there you had to cross over uh, uh, Canal, a you got, or you got to you got to cross you got to come across the Mississippi River back back in those days you had to catch a ferry because they didn't have that bridge they didn't have the bridge about. see they had no bridge you had to come across the ferry or you had to come across the Sunshine Bridge and then drive forty minutes or you had to go across the New Orleans Bridge and drive back this way for 35, 40 minutes. But you had to cross the water to get the house. Okay, that's what I thought, right? You had so to cross back, the water. But plus, back at that time, they didn't have all the accessories that they Ain't no that question. It wasn't all these different crazy. highways, different roads. Even today, as you're traveling down the highway in my hometown, if you're traveling down the highway, you got to get on a highway we call Highway 20. It's, right, it's Highway 20 River Road. It's one way in, there's <laughs> one way out. And when you pull in, as a sign says, Welcome to Lucy. Welcome to Edgar. And if you go about three miles down the road, you're leaving Edgar. It's about three miles from this end to the other end. I know that because I used to jog. That's my condition. <laughs> okay, you know, yeah, I go from one one end of town to the next, one side to the next. That was my condition, running up down the levee, and that's kind of what it was. But yeah. that had to be the pride. I mean, today you've got to still be the pride of Agar because back then, when, when there was segregation, it was just it was just opening up. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. But you had a little small high school. Mm -hmm. You played quarterback. Yes. And, but you was a quarterback that ran the ball. Right? Yes. That's, all, that's, uh, that's exactly right. That's, that's exactly right. So what was that like playing quarterback in high school and then dominated every aspect of the game? It, for me back then, it was phenomenal. I mean, it was absolutely great. But you was a big boy. It was great. It was absolutely great. Uh, I loved it. Um, I think the greatness of it was, uh, believe it or not, my high school, uh, high school, my, my entire high school, Went from eighth grade. We didn't go from nine. It wasn't nine to twelve. It was from eight to twelve because we don't have enough people. We don't have enough time. So we went from elementary school was one to seven. High school was eight to twelve. From eight to twelve, I think it was four hundred students in the whole class, four hundred in the whole school. And uh, it was just a great school with great history with great tradition for sports. Yeah, Edgar High, high School. Okay. It was second one at that time. Second one. It was okay. second one high because it was all black. Okay. See, so Second World High School was an all black school. All black David Award. Great right? history, great, great history, great, I mean, just rich in, in talent and ability. And let me say this to you by far. When I left, I was the number one recruit in the nation, right? In the nation. In the nation. From, and I'm, did I'm did, did, did you realize that? Did you realize that? Did yes. <laughs> yes. Yes, I did. Well, you, that was, well, you still got a little arrogance about it. Yes, I did. It yes, I did. <laughs> that was, uh, as, as people would say, that was warranted. It was earned because. Um, you know, we we started off. I started playing quarterback in eighth grade, but my brother and my, my brother, my uncle, my first cousin, they had already set they had already set the bar. The bar was what it was. It was a guy named it was a guy named Haywood Jack, who I believe could have been one of the greatest baseball players to ever play. And that was my idol, my buddy Haywood. That was my guy, you know. But listen, my my oldest brother, you know, when you say I was the love, and I'm still a star today. No, no, Donnie, my brother. Is the guy Donnie, my brother, is the star and the love and the lover and everybody loving the day. Donnie is the guy that 
people believe walks on water, you know, my oldest brother. But I came along and I started playing. I lost two. I lost two games. I think I lost two games in eighth grade as a starting quarterback. And I, I, I think I lost one in ninth grade. And I don't think I lost another one. So, so you, I, total I, domination. That's what you tell yeah. me. So the, the, total what happened, domination. What happened was we won the division. We won the division my sophomore year. We ended up winning. We were ready to go to playoff, and then we got disqualified because one of our players wasn't eligible academically. He was supposed to have gone to summer school. He didn't go. So after he didn't go, they disqualified us, knocked us out of the playoff, and then we we never lost a game. We lost a game. I lost a game. Two games. My eighth grade year, I lost one game. My ninth grade year, and we never lost an end of the game. So and you caught my quarterback since eighth grade. Quarterback. I was quarterback since eighth grade. We had two coaches, the head coach and one assistant coach. We only had two coaches on the whole staff. So the head coach in turn says, "Terry, we good. You know what the hell you doing? You run the offense. I'm gonna run the defense." <laughs> he give us our playbook, and I'm the guy that put all the plays together. I'm the guy that call them people who knew me and watched would tell you. They would see me on the field. I'd get on my knees in the huddle and draw up the play. So this your coaching started at that my time. My head coach told me at that time, you're going to be a great coach. You know how to run this thing. Here, you do this. So in the, eighth the, grade. In eighth grade, your coach started and you spoke that to you. In eighth grade, my head coach told me, you take the you take the offense, I got the defense. So you was and a coach. Was, I was a coach. I was a coach. I was a playing coach. And uh, like I told you, you know, we end up. I think I end up going something like forty-four and three. In my <laughs> okay, whole coach. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. You know what I mean? So it was phenomenal, man. And then I, 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 end, I ended up, uh, believe it or not, I ended up signing with LSU, which blew everybody in the world's mind. Nobody in America thought I'd be going to LSU. Okay, well, but I'll tell you another story. Okay. I'll tell you another story before you ask me that why. I went to visit all of them. I, I went to Notre Dame. I went to Colorado. I went to Alabama. I went to. I went to. USC. I, I was going to visit all these schools, and I'm going. I'm visiting. I committed. I went and visited Oklahoma, and I committed to Oklahoma. I went to Oklahoma on a Saturday mornings at Oklahoma, sitting there playing. Never forget it. Greg Pruitt, the great Greg Pruitt, who I ended up coaching, who I ended up coaching with the Raiders. I signed him and brought him to the Raiders. I became his coach. Greg Pruitt scored eight touchdowns that day. I think it was against Notre Dame. Greg scored eight touchdowns. I said, man, I got to come be a part of this. So I go in there, and I'm getting ready to leave, come back home. And I told Coach Chuck Fairbank, I said, I made up my mind. I'm coming to Oklahoma. And I committed. I was going to Oklahoma. And uh, the next day, Coach Fairbank accepted the head coaching job with the New England Patriots. So when I got up on looking at TV and I read that in the newspaper, I'm like, why the hell am I going to Oklahoma? You could have told me this. I right? could have told me that yesterday. <laughs> I said, why am I going there if he leaving? And why would he be come up there? I need you. I want you. I need you. I want you. And then he packs up and leave and go to. I said, no, that guy just walked out on me. I can't go to Oklahoma. And then that night, when he signed to go to Oklahoma, that night I'm sitting down home and I'm like, I'm not. I'm down, you know, because I had made up my mind I was going there. And now I got to change my mind. And that night I'm sitting down home and I never forget I'm sitting in the front porch, just sitting down my mama, we're sitting down talking and this big, long black limousine pulls up in our driveway. And my mom like, who's that? Do you expect somebody to come? I said, no, I don't expect nobody. I don't know who that is. And who got out of it? Some guy, uh, what was that guy's name? Uh, some guy named Edward Edwards. <laughs> <laughs> the governor, the governor of Louisiana. Louisiana. So we said, but he's been my house a time or two. So he pulls up in the driveway and he comes in and he says, hey, 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 uh, I hope y'all got some red bean and rice on the stove. I need to eat. I'm hungry. I said, what are you doing here? Yeah, what are you doing here? <laughs> I'm coming here to against, convince you again. LSU is the best place in the world for you. Now, Governor Edward had been to my house two, maybe three times. You got you know, me. But he had fell in love with my mom cooking. If he wasn't in love with me, he was in love with my mom cooking. So I never forget it. He came in. He sat down at the table. He stood there eating and eating and eating. And he said, well, one thing I know for sure. I know she's got rice on the stove because she cooks rice every day. He says, so I hope she got something good to go with it. We sat down, we ate, we talked, we talked, we talked. And, uh, you know, he left about 1 o'clock in the morning, got in his limo. What, 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 what time did he get there? Probably got there about 8, about 8 o'clock in the evening. He stayed there. Stayed, until, stayed there all night, eating, drinking a glass of wine, talking to my daddy, him, eating my mama's food, sitting on the couch, taking his shoes off. The guy <laughs> just made himself at home. He made himself at home, you know. But so, the next day, the very next day, the very next day was the Saturday morning. My mom, my uh, my mom sitting at the table. My grandfather came by. My grandfather was a super intelligent guy, you know, and very very smart, great athletic guy. Used to be a coach in high school. 
So he came by, sat down there with my mom, sat down there talking. He said, come on, Terry, let's go outside for a walk. He and I took a walk, walk outside the back. And uh, the last thing he said to me was, um, you know, your mom told me you had committed to go to Oklahoma, which I think was stupid. Well, you know, your grandfather did You know, uh, oh, my, yes, your mom did. Yeah. And, he, and again, he's my grandfather at the time. My grandfather was about 6'5", about 3'10". Good. Real Good. massive Good. man, very intelligent guy. And he said, do you plan on living in Oklahoma? when you finish playing? I said, no. Where do you plan on making a living? Where do you plan on your kids growing up? Where do you plan on living and growing up and when your career is finished? I said, here. He said, well, why would you go to Oklahoma? He said, if you want to, you plan on living and making a job, making a career of it, and you plan on living the rest of your life in Louisiana, you need to go to Louisiana school. He said, that tells me you need to go to the state school. And if that governor has been in three, four times and eat up all your mama food, you need to go back, you need to go up a bad room recruiting players. I started helping Dale. Dale Brown would come and sit out in my dormitory room. Me and him would sit there for hours, man. I'd go to his house, we'd sit for hours and yeah, talk yeah. about recruiting brothers. And Y'all feel that type of relationship? Brothers. Dale Brown, man, was unbelievable for me. I mean, Dale Brown was phenomenal. I mean, we sat and talked and, uh, you know, he, he was just open-minded and he just, Terry, I want LSU to be the best school in the world. I want LSU to have the best basketball player. LSU didn't really, really realize what they had in the Dale Brown. They had no idea. Dale Brown was ahead had this time. No idea. Dale Brown wasn't here coaching. Dale Brown wasn't at LSU coaching to pay his house payment. Dale Brown wasn't here coaching to make some money to go buy a car. Dale Brown wasn't really, he wasn't really coaching to feed his family. Dale Brown was here coaching to take a school named LSU who was only known a little bit because of a guy named Pete, Pistol Pete Maverick, right? Pistol Pete, Pete was the man, you know what I mean? Right. And that's what LSU was known for Pistol. They weren't known for going winning and winning the national championship. Dale Brown was here to build his own program to go win a national championship and to have this school. Dale Brown's goal was to make LSU what UCLA was back in the day. Let's go win 10, 12, 13 national championships. That was Dale Brown's goal. And uh, his goal was, Terry, I need to get as many brothers as I can to come here. I need your help. So I'd be at his house every other every other night almost. We sit and he opened his home, home to you. He opened his house to me with no problem at all, man. It was unbelievable. And that, and that had to be different from you coming from a little small town and, and all, you know, African community. community. Yeah. Absolutely. And but, you, you go sit in somebody like a Dale Brown house who's open. Give you black, black, black. No question. But let me say you say to you again, and that was the thing that I loved more than anything in life. And I didn't learn this in no class I went to on LSU campus. I learned from riding in that same limo with Governor Edward Edwards. I learned how to walk into anybody's house with my head up, with my chest up, and smiling on my face. Mm -hmm. Edward Edwards taught me, ain't nobody you gonna ever meet gonna be bigger than you. I learned that from Edwin Edwards. And from that day on, I took that all the way to, but today I'm in Ken Hall of Fame. So I took it all the way to the Hall of Fame. You, Ain't you, nobody you, house you, right you in the Hall of Fame. You're in the Hall of Fame. Hall of Hall of fame. Now, and I took it all the way to it. You, you in the Louisiana High School Hall of Fame. I'm in the New Orleans Hall yeah, of Fame. You're in the New Orleans Hall of Fame. But you're not in the... I'm not in the LSU Hall of Fame. That's amazing. Uh, it's unbelievable. Yeah, it's unbelievable. I mean, but I can't get, I, I seem like they say, I can't get College Temple to vote for me. So <laughs> all, them, they put up all them basketball people, all them basketball people I recruited, all them basketball players I brought in, and, uh, all them football players that came in. Let me go back with you to Harrison, you know, Harrison and Clint. I know for a fact those two guys signed. They spent that Saturday with me. They hung out Friday. They spent Saturday with me. We hung out Saturday after the game. Sunday, them two guys said they committed to come to LSU. So all the people I've signed and brought, and I can't be in LSU. I'm not in LSU. All the no, thing. not just that. Your yeah. your, your ruckus speak for itself. No your question. work speak for itself. Ain't no question. I, I, and you're not I, even the LSU Hall of Fame. I guess I can't get college devil to vote for me. I don't know what that is. I don't know what that is. So. But Harrison Ford, your question was, tell me about Harrison, man. Harrison came in here. Harrison, what was Harrison's nickname? Sugar Bear. Man. Sugar, Bowl. Sugar Bowl. Sugar Bowl. Sugar <laughs> Bowl. Sugar Bowl. Harrison came in here, man, and he was smooth, and the dude was Bang. fluid. And he was strong. He was. He had great balance. Um, I, I always told people, man. Uh, Harrison was Harrison Francis. Harrison Francis was a smooth, low sense of gravity, great eyes, slippery feet. He was Ike Hilliard before Ike Hilliard was Ike Hilliard. 
Harrison Ford was smooth, man. And that guy was good, can carry, can run, can make you miss, can shake and bake, can run over you. And he was very, very smart. He was very, very smart. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then Harrison came in, and the Sugar Bowl came in, man. Me and him got to be friends, and we got close. And uh, and then they said the same thing they told Sugar Bowl. You know, hey, man, uh, you got a lot of talent, man. You know, if we can get you to play a little fullback, we can use you and Terry together. You know, and Sugar Bowl was like, no, 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 hell no. Y'all get Terry out of the way. Get Terry off the field. Let me go in there. Let me go in there and do my thing. Yeah, and, sure, that's yeah, that. yeah, you know, and but his mind was, their mind was, and we were going to run some veer. See, we were going to run some veer where that ball would go, you, they got to read it, you know, put it in the fullback's stomach and read it and go down the line and pitch it, whatever. And Sugar Bowl was, okay, that sounds okay. That's, and then when we got in, they start running lead and lead and lead blocking, and lead, blocking, blocking, blocking. Block block Sugar Bowl was like, oh, no, this ain't what I signed up for. I didn't come here for this. No, this ain't what happened. And I was like, Harrison, just take your time, and you don't need to take my job. Just chill out a little bit, practice a little bit. They're going to hand it to you. You do what you do. They hand it to me. I'm going to do it. We're going to win games, you know, and I'm going to be gone. Because you, know, be you, you wanted him out there. Yeah, you know what I mean? Because Sugar Bowl could play, man. Sugar Bowl was smooth, man. He was smooth. You know, like I said, he could play. And Clint was phenomenal. Clint ended up being my roommate. We ended up rooming together, you know. But Sugar Bowl was smooth as hell, man, and had great feet, great hands. Good, but his family had great history. His brother played about 10 years in the league with yeah, Atlanta Falcons. Yeah, you know? Wallace, Wallace, Wallace was a great player, man. But Sugar Bowl was very, very talented, man. But Sugar Bowl... He couldn't uh, play the next he, level. He couldn't play the next level, no question about it. You know? <laughs> but he, <laughs> he, did not want to be, uh, he did not want to be a lead blocker. And uh, he just you know, he felt like once we got in the game, uh, forget that wishbone and veer, all that shit, just hand me the ball. Uh, you know, you know, fake it to me to hand it to Terry. And, no, I ain't doing that. You know? And then, like I said, once or twice a game, they call, you know, they call fourteen lead. And he got to go lead. You know, and uh, he he didn't want that. That just that wasn't him. That wasn't what he what he wanted to do. And I tell you, what's phenomenal. You know, again, like I tell you, all my years of coaching, I'm in the NFL. I'm coaching. I got two players who are two great halfback. I got a guy named Bo Jackson, and I got a guy named Marcus Allen. How you play them two guys? Well, you coach both. I coach both of them guys. You know what I mean? And uh, I've had them all, man. I coach Eric Dickinson. I've coached all of them, man. But I'm coaching those two at the same time. I got to figure out how I'm gonna, how I'm gonna do this. And both of them got to play. But, yeah. let me, but let me say, I this, have a trophy with. I have no question. You know, two of the greatest ever, right? But my experience with Sugar Bowl told me what to do. <laughs> my experience that with Sugar served, Bowl that served, that served, served the purpose. You know? Also, your own personal experience. Uh, no question. You, you know, you, you're the number one guy in everything you do. Yes, so. Absolutely. But now i got to figure this thing out because it goes back. And like you said, that's how that high school coaching, when the head coach said, Terry, you take the offense, I got the defense. That's how it was such a phenomenal thing for me. Because now all of a sudden I'm sitting there saying, okay, one of y'all got to be Sugar Bowl, and one of y'all got to be Terry Rissing. How am I going to do this? How do do this? So I found, this is what I did. I found the nicest guy. I found the guy that was the easiest to talk to, and I found the guy who was the smoothest guy, right? Mm -hmm. So I walked over there, and I said, Marcus, I need your help. And I know who, Marcus, I need your help. Well, I know Marcus is Terry Rissing, Bo Jackson is Sugar Bowl. You know what I mean? So I said, Marcus, I need your help, man. I need your help. Oh, okay. All right, okay. With you. I need you to play fullback. Oh, okay. All right. I said, don't worry about it now. I'm not putting you in and go lead block, lead block, lead block. And I said, I'm going to do some things with you. I'm going to flex you out. I'm going to throw you some passes. I'm going to flex board. I'm going to hand it to you. I'm going to hand you something from the fullback spot. Like, okay, all right, okay, all right. And then the first time I line up in that tandem, when Marcus is fullback, Bo is halfback, I call 15 lead. You know, and I think Marcus looked at the sideline and gave me the finger. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> you, you didn't tell me you were doing this. You said, yeah, but yeah, you, didn't tell me, you didn't tell me I had to go lead block and do this. But let me say this to you. Marcus went in there, stuck his head in there because he had done it before. He was a lead blocker. For, for, uh, for White. For White. Charles White. Charles White. Charles White. So he knew how to do that. He went in there, hit the guy in the first play of the game against Denver. Whoop, goes in there, hit that wheel linebacker. Boy went 68 yards for a touchdown. Marcus jumped off the ground and said, this is going to work, you know. Oh, okay. We ended up winning the game. He played fullback, blah, blah, blah. And then all of a sudden, we came out here to play New Orleans. We played New Orleans the first the first play. I, I'm calling plays now. So the first play, both takes off down the left end. Marcus cut the Mike linebacker. Both takes off. He goes 28 yard, 28 yard first down. Second play of the game, I said, ooh, that was a great play. I'm going to run it to the right. I go high, I go high right. We run that 48 sweep going right. Both boy, 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 hit that thing. Take off down the right sideline, blah, 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 blah. You gain 18 yards. That's two plays. That man got almost 50 yards the first two rushes of the game. And then Bo said, oh, Terry Wade, you're working with two yards. My hamstring, my hamstring. <laughs> he told me to pull his hamstring. So now Marcus, comes, Marcus jumps back at halfback. At the end of the day, Marcus got 12 carries or 18 carries for 
160. Everybody girls. happy. Yeah. Everybody happy. You know what I mean? So, but so that's just, in other words, that's strategic planning on the coach's part. No question. Knowing how to utilize right. your talents and no to make sure everybody happy. Absolutely. And again, the fact that I had things I could draw back from. You know, my coaching days when I was when I was drawing up plays in the dirt in high school. You know, I could draw it up. You know what I mean? My experience with when I had Sugar Bowl, I'm here with Sugar Bowl. How I'm gonna keep both of them guys happy? You know what I mean? I'm gonna keep I'm gonna keep Sugar Bowl happy, and I'm gonna keep Terry Biscuit happy. But I'm gonna keep Marcus Alpin Marcus Alpin happy, and I'm gonna keep Bo Jackson happy. And then it's been phenomenal for me because now all of a sudden, 30 years later, I'm coaching a guy named Roddy White and Julio Jones. How about keep them two guys happy? You know what I mean? So how, so, how, did, that, how did that work? Yeah, fantastic, fantastic. Because I learned, I learned over the course of time who's Terry Biscay and who's Sugar Bowl, and that taught me how to teach them guys and train them and handle them separately. Yeah, because you don't, you, know what I mean? you lost a great player like Sugar Bowl, absolutely, you know, great Harrison. Person. Absolutely, just yeah. because you couldn't get it across to him, we can do this together. Just be patient. Understand this. It's coming. It ain't got to come tomorrow, but it's coming. Just be patient with it. And then for the betterment of the team, for us to win the day, we need both of them. We need both of us. And once you get guys to, everybody want to win and everybody want to be coached. And once you get guys to understand, this is how we're going to do it. You see, so when I got the Roddy White and Julio Jones, then Roddy White became Terry Biscuit, Julio Jones was Sugar Bowl. See, so I just had to go over here. I explained to Roddy White, this is Terry Biscuit, this is what you're going to do. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. But now I got to go get Sugar Bowl over here, which is Julio Jones. I got to go get Sugar Bowl. Don't worry about it. Yours coming. Yours coming. It's going to be okay. Be patient. Yeah. So when Roddy was catching 102, Sugar Bowl was catching 77, 78, 79. And then two years later, it flipped. And then Julio Jones. Who's a bad boy? Who's a bad player? That's, that's, a, big old, that's a big old receiver. Big old receiver. Yeah, yeah, no question. Big as hell. You know what I mean? <laughs> and that's what it was, is just trying to understand all the mechanics, all that, that stuff. You know a, a, and, you a, know. But it's the human psychic that you have to no tap question. into. No question. That's but exactly you know, right. I know that my first, when you came back after your rookie year, you went to, uh, that's, that's kind of go back to that too, where you was drafted to the Oakland Raiders by the great Al Davis and John Madden. Yeah. Man, you got to share that experience. What was your first year like being part of that? Well, let me let me let me tell you this as far as the draft itself. You know, uh, you know, again, uh, I come out of high school up number one, right? I'm at LSU. Remember, I'm the SEC MVP. Oh. I'm academic all American. You academic done, all American too? I done broke all the records. I done set all the records. I done won the James Corbett Award for the college football player in Louisiana. I beat out Doug Williams for the James Corbett Award. So I ride around with my chest out. I'm the man. I'm the man. And I go to the governor's house every Saturday morning, me and him sitting down having breakfast and drinking coffee. You know what I mean? So I'm the man. You know what I mean? Point to that. Yeah. So I walk around LSU and I feel that way, you know? And the first day of the draft, the first day of the draft, I'm sitting there, and at that time the draft was eight, uh, 12 rounds. Right. And they go, uh, five or six the first day. I'm sitting there the first day. Bum, 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 bum. And man, I'm hearing some great, great, great running back. Earl Campbell get drafted. This guy get drafted. You know, the same year? The same year, you know. <laughs> and Tony Dorsett get drafted. And he got drafted. And I'm sitting there like, where the hell's Terry Biscay? Where the hell's Terry Biscay? So I am so frustrated, man, that I'm like, God. Ooh, you're the man. I'm the man. You're the man. But they ain't called my name. They ain't called call their name. And they ain't round six. Round six. Round five or six, they call my name yet. So I said, no, nah, man, screw it. I'm not going to the NFL. I don't want to go. I'm going to stay here at LSU. I'm going to go work for, I'm going to go work with Billy Cannon and a guy named Jerry McKern. I'm going to work with them guys. Jerry was my lawyer, great friend of mine. I said, no, nah, I'm going to stay here in Bad Boys and just make a living, man. I ain't going to play no poor ball, man. So they with it. So my name don't get drafted, man. I'm frustrated, man. I can't get it, man. From, from junior high school, to college, you've been the man. I'm the man. Yeah, you know you're man. going top. I, I got to go in the top two, two, three rounds. Right? And no question that. I done did all I could do. I done broke this record. I done broke that record. I done set this record. I done done this. I'm the SEC MVP. I'm the LSU MVP. I'm, uh, you know, I won the James Carpenter one. I beat out the guy. What else I need to do? You know, what else can a guy do? It's like you asking me why I'm not in the LSU Hall of Fame. I don't know. What else can I, what else can I, I do? The only thing I thought I could have done better at LSU, 
I could have went over and averaged 32 points a game in basketball. I mean, <laughs> what else did a guy do? You know what I mean? So when I don't get drafted the first day, I'm like, well, oh, come on, man, what's going on? What happened here? What, what, what are we doing? You know? And then I'm sitting there and say, okay, man, it's done, it's done. And I remember, man, I spent the whole night, I couldn't sleep, man. I mean, I, I I mean that, that, you had to be in a bad place. Oh, my God. It, it, got, was, it got dark. And my mom and my dad and had wanted to come up and spend the day with me. And I said, no, no, no. And I had a girlfriend. And fortunate enough, she came and spent the evening with me. And me and her sit around and I'm crying on her shoulder. You know, I'm sitting there crying that, on I her mean, shoulder. That, but see, yeah. that, that's real. This is, that's real. This is real. People, yeah. don't, people don't realize. People think this is a joke. No, no, but this is this real. Because in your mind, yes. I'm the best. I'm the best. I'm and the best. I've been the best. Yes. But now the yeah. Yes, now I'm getting ready to go to that next level. And, and, and now, then, you know, it's a whole, it's a whole different world. And, yeah, people, yeah, yeah. And some other people don't see the same. Yeah, you see what I'm saying? So now, I'm, you have, now reality kicking in. That's right. That's right. <laughs> like, like the world don't see me like Louisiana sees me. <laughs> yeah. And, and th that level, you know, the NFL certainly don't see me like LSU or like Second Ward or Lucy or Edgar. But people don't see but, me like but, that. But you still you know? justify in your mind. They don't know what they're losing. Uh -huh. losing. Yeah. So, you, yeah. so you're talking yeah. to yourself now. So now I'm mad at them. To hell with them. If they want me, if they want me, they can't have me. Look, they, they now you're going to show them. I'm going to show them. Show they call me. I'm going to tell them no. You know what I mean? But just as I'm making that decision that I'm not going to go, my phone rang. The next day, right? Drafting started. My phone rang. Bang, 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 bang. Phone ring, I answer the phone. The guy says, hello, Terry Rubisky, how you doing? He said, uh, 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 this is Al Davis, the owner of the Oakland Raiders, uh, the world champion, Oakland Raiders, <laughs> my heart drive. <laughs> now, he said, the Oakland Raiders, I'm like, okay, all right, okay. And I know John Madden is the coach, right. but I don't know who this is on the phone, Al Davis. Oh, you know where I don't know who that is. You know what I mean? And he says, you know, uh, Oakland Raiders, he says, the world champion. He repeated that, the world champ, Oakland Raiders. Okay, what's up, what's up, what's up? Yeah, all right, what can I you do got, for you? You got renewed life now. Yeah. He said, okay, I'm calling to find out. He said, I just want to make sure you're still living, uh, you're still breathing. Are you okay? You're able to walk? Uh, no injuries, no broke legs, nothing? You okay physically? No medicals? Yeah, yeah, I'm good, yeah, yeah, yeah. He says, I'm getting ready to draft you. He didn't say we. He said, I'm, I am getting ready to draft you. I'm getting ready to draft you. And uh, I just want to make sure you're okay. Here, now you can now you can talk to a guy named John Madden. So he put John Madden on the phone. Everybody in the world knows John Madden. Now listen, now, the Raiders had just won two weeks or three weeks before. They had just won the, the Super Bowl. They had just beat the Minnesota Vikings in Pasadena. They, they were top of the world. You know? So now I'm sitting there saying, well, if I'm good enough for the world champs, <laughs> the hell with the rest of y'all. You know what I mean? For First round, second round, they need Don't make no difference. You're going to I'm going, Super Bowl I'm going to a yeah. Super Bowl team. So I'm sitting down now in my little apartment over here, over in, uh, what's that, Village Square over there. I'm sitting in my little apartment, right? And I'm like, I don't care. The hell with her. And I'm sitting down there and I'm sitting with my girl. And I'm like, screw the New Orleans Saints. <laughs> to hell with the Saints. To hell with <laughs> I'm cussing the Saints out. Man, this one, man, them. I'm good enough for the world champ. And listen, why? I got up off of that chair. I got up off of that sofa. I walked outside my, my little apartment door, right? And I forgot it's called Village Square or whatever it was, man, right there off the campus. Boston right? Village. Boston Village. Boston Village. I walked out there, opened up the door, went outside by the swimming pool and said, hell with them. I'm good enough for the Raiders. I'm going to the Raiders. You know what I mean? So I'm mad at the Saints. I'm down the road. The Saints don't want to call me. The hell with the Saints. And of course, my house, you know, my house, the Saints, Saints all over my house. My mama had a wall painted in Saints color. My mama loved the Saints. Listen, I coached 47 years. There's never a team I've ever coached. We played the Saints, my mama pulled for me. Never. My mama died pulling for the Saints, brother. So I'm like, the hell with the Saints. You know, I'm not good enough for the Saints. Screw New Orleans. I the hell with them. So the Raiders called me. You know, bam, 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 bam. I fly out to Oakland. Sit down and talk, man. Yeah. So this, this six round. Eight round. Eight round. I got drafted in the eight, eight round. round. I got drafted in the eight, eight round, bro. I got drafted in the eight round. I went out to the Raiders. Raiders are loaded. They running back running backs are stacked, man. They got running backs everywhere, man. And they just won the Super Bowl. Clarence Davis should have probably should have got the MVP. You know, Freddie won it, but Clarence Davis could have got it, you know. They got Clarence Davis, Mark Van Egan, Pete Bannister, Carl Gary. They got running backs just Coming out the wazoo, man. I'm like, oh my gosh, you know. <laughs> but listen, you say, man, quite good now. But 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 what happened to me? I'm so goofy, you know. That little town I'm from, I thought it was like LSU. 
I didn't know I had to go make the tea. Oh, I thought once they drafted you, it. you on the tea. So I went and bought me a little Vegas station wagon, man. Packed up all my little stuff in my little suitcases, little foot lockers, man, and took off and drove. I drove all the way out there, man. I drove from here all the way to Oakland, California. Got my little three suitcases, foot lockers. So I'm, from New York, that's a 25-hour drive. I got, that's two days it took me, man. I got everything in my little Vegas station wagon. I'm gone, bro. So I drove out there, got up and drove, man. Went to San Francisco. But I thought I'm here, you know. I thought it's like being in Omi. You know, they drafted you, you here, you know what I mean? So man, I got out there, man, and uh, it was it was great. It was unbelievable. And I tell you what happened. I tell you what happened to me. I got out there. And it was a guy named Clarence Davis. I run back. I told you, one MVP. Clarence Davis. Listen to me good now. Clarence Davis' grandmother lived next door to my brother, there, Nelson Jones' grandmother. In, them two in, grandmothers. In, in No, in Los Angeles, Los California. Angeles. Okay. Them two grandmothers live next door to each other. Clarence grew up next to my next door to my grandmother. So they all do. So when I got the, who is Terry Robiskin? Where is this white boy? <laughs> white boy. He thought I was a white boy because of Robiskin. Oh, okay. But he couldn't figure out his brain because my grandmother was black. Who, who is this white boy? Terry Robiskin. Where is Terry Robiskin? Terry Robiskin. I'm like, what did I do? I, I'm, a, I'm I'm hiding. I don't want to. I don't want to say that. I'm hiding. You know. But, uh, Stand up, sway you, stand up, stand up, stand up. And then uh, Otis sister, I was sitting at the table right with Otis sister. And Otis said, you Terry, but stand up. So I stood up, come here, come here. So Clarence Davis brought me in front of the whole, in the cafeteria, in front of all the whole team, everybody. And gave me the biggest hug. The biggest, going, the biggest kiss. And he says, man, your grandmother been feeding me since I was about 11 years old. That woman can show sure cook. He said, it part of the, part, she's part of the reason I'm here. He said, I got you. You and me. I got now, you. He was a running back, too. <laughs> he was a running back. A bad running back. He was a good one. You know, and like I said, he should have won the MVP. I think he had 115 yards in Super But now I go back to the table. And all his sister on says, you and me the rest of the time you here. He said, I don't care what nobody tell you. Anybody, any player ask you to do anything, you tell them no. Tell them what he said to tell you no. Don't you do nothing for no one. Don't carry no helmet. Don't go get no water. Don't get no gatorade. You ain't nobody else's rookie but me. You stay with me, I got you. He said, Clarence Davis respect you like that, you for me. That became my guy. No. So now Clarence would have me come to his room at night. Whenever we put together, this is training again, put together the playbook. Clarence Davis would have me come to his room at night, sit down and study with me. And he'd sit down and study and said, do this and we'll do this and we'll do this and we'll do this. But then finally he'd come up and said, let me tell you what you need to do, Terry. Because the Raiders had drafted another running back in the second round. A guy named Ted McKnight, but John Madden drafted that guy. Oh, no. So that's why Al Davis called and drafted me. Because when they said they're going to take another running back in the eighth round, uh, John Madden said, no, we don't need no more running back. I don't want a running back. I already got my running back. And Al Davis says, I'm taking this guy. Well, the reason Al Davis was really sold on me was a guy named Billy Cannon. Billy Cannon had played for Al. And then Billy picked up the phone and called Al Davis and said, man, you got to sign my kid. This kid can play. I don't know why nobody has drafted this kid. I think there's going to be a hell of a player. You got to sign. So Billy Cannon called Al Davis on your behalf. On behalf, and that's the Man, only that reason. That is powerful. That's the only reason Al Davis had. But but the thing was this: Billy Davis had got drafted in the first round. I mean, uh, Billy Cannon got drafted in the first round by the Houston Oilers. They had drafted him as a running back, but by, 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 they didn't like him. They cut him. He didn't make it. Al Davis took him and made him a tight end. And he became a damn good tight end and played for a lot of years. So Al loved Billy because Billy had proven him right and proven he could play. So Billy told Al, you think I proved you right? Take this kid. You'll find out what that means. So Billy picked up the phone personally. No agent called. I had no agent, no agent representing. Billy called Al Davis. Al Davis said, I'm drafting him. John Madden said, no. Al Davis said, I'm taking him. And Al Davis took me. So Clarence Davis now tells me, in the private, you can't beat me out. You won't get my job. You can't beat out Mark Van Egan. You can't beat out Pete Van. He's telling you, he's he being real. He's being real. You can't take that guy's job. You can't take his job. You can't take this job. You can't take his job. You can't beat us out. We veterans, we established, and we just won the Super Bowl. You can't take our job. But you know what job you can take? R3 on kickoff coverage, punt protection, backfield. He said, go play special team. And if you go play special team better than all them other guys they drafted, you're gonna make this team. He told me that. That's the great that's the best advice. Best advice you can get. So when he told me that, I had never played special team. 
I, as we always say, I'm the number one recruit in the nation. Yeah, I ain't got to be no goddamn special. I'm a quarterback. I come down to LSU, I'm the MVP. I ain't got to be the player no special team. I had never played special team. So you never you played special team? Never played special team in my life. But you can tell me something, partner. If you tell me you need me to do this to get the job done, ain't nobody going to work, man. I promise you that. Mm -hmm. One thing you find out from Lucy, Louisiana, they go to Louisiana, nobody can outwork us. So when Clarence told me that, the next morning he said, you go find that special team coach, tell him I'm here, I'm here to get a job. Go tell him that. I went and told that coach just what he told me. Coach's name was Joe Scanella. I said, Coach Joe, how you feeling? I'm doing good. Coach, I'm here, I'm here to get a job. Oh, I like you. I like you. <laughs> coach Joe took me, put me on every special team that we had. He put me on every one. First game, I get one, two tackles. I got put protection. I'm the fullback. I call out all the protection. I call out the slides. I call out this. You know. I'm plus, in training plus camp. Plus that coaching. You, you know. Got it. Listen, I'm in training camp. I'm in training camp. Back then, training camp was six weeks. You remember that one? I'm in training camp for four weeks, practicing every day, playing every day, working every day. I ain't made a minimum mistake yet. Been there four weeks as a rookie. I have not made one minimum mistake in no job they've ever given me. I ain't made a minimum mistake yet. It's it blowing their minds. See? The higher I'm on special teams. I have two tackles this week. I had two tackles last week. I had two tackles the week before. I had another tackle. You make it happen. You going out, you going out and make it plays. Here's what happened. I'm going to give you this story. It's the last preseason game. Raiders going down to LA. We're going to LA to play the Rams. The Rams are now in Los Angeles. We play them on Thursday. We fly down on Wednesday. My mom and my daddy had seen every game I played in high school and college. My mom and my daddy had never missed a game. My junior year, if you can remember, I'm at LSU. We go up to Lincoln, Nebraska to play the Cone Huskers. My mom, my daddy, and my brother Donnie, and one everybody loved, and my auntie Hilda. They drove from New Orleans to Lincoln. Come see the game. My mama called me. She said, we have seen every game you've played your whole life. If you, go, if you don't make a team, if you don't make this team, you're going to get cut. That's the end of your career. She said, we're coming to Los Angeles to see this preseason game so we can say we saw you play one professional football game. Yeah. I said, wow, come on. My mom, my dad, my auntie Hilda got on a Greyhound bus. A bus? Yeah. They, what you thought they food? They, they can't afford no damn flight. Are you crazy? They can't afford no flight. They caught a Greyhound bus and they went from New Orleans to Los Angeles. And they stayed with my grandmother again. The same grandmother stayed next to the Clarence Davis. They stayed with my grandmother. They got in there Tuesday. They left Saturday. They got in there Tuesday. Greyhound bus. 39.95. Greyhound. <laughs> they got it. They went there. They stayed by my grandmother's house. When we got to town on Wednesday, my mom and him came to the hotel to see me the night before the game. My mama said, Terry, I got to see John Madden. I want to take a picture with him before I go. John Madden was what, 6'4", 6'5", 310 pounds. My mama, 5'5", 5'5", 310 pounds. <laughs> That's going to be out of a picture. That's going to be out of a picture. So I'm like, no, mom, no, mom. We working. Leave John Madden alone. No, you don't need to meet John Madden. No, be quiet. She said, I come here all the way from New Orleans. If I see him, I won't meet him. I'm going to talk. Just then the elevator door opened. Like God said, come, party. Elevator door, John Madden walk over, my mama sprint to Big John. Oh, John, I'm Terry's mama. How you feeling? I'm going to give you a hug. Can I give you a kiss? Oh, my God, we love you. You took our son. You drafted him. We love you. Oh, my God, we love you. She took a picture with him. She hugged him. She kissed him. And John looking at him, he says, yeah, hi. What are you doing here? I thought y'all were from Louisiana. What you doing here in Los Angeles? And she said, oh, yeah, yeah, we from Louisiana. But we caught the bus. We came to the game. What? Y'all caught a bus? Y'all caught a bus? From New Orleans? That's almost three days. Yeah, it took three days. So, John said, y'all took a bus to come from Louisiana to come here to watch a preseason game? Oh, my God. Oh, okay. All right, okay. The next day, we go out and play the, we get ready to play the Rams, Thursday night football. We're in the locker room, kicks off, kick off at six. Sitting in the locker room, sitting next to Clarence David. I always stayed next to Clarence. Clarence always educated me, training me, telling me what to do, you know what I mean? I'm sitting down next to Ken. We're going over, going over the playbook, looking at it, looking. Because I'm going to play, you know, last preseason game, I'm going to play a little bit, you know. And Clarence said, You want this, Terry? You want this? Terry, you want this? So now you're going to play the running back. I'm going to play the running back. I'm getting fired up. <clears throat> I'm sitting there getting fired up with the running back. John Madden comes over. Hey! Walks over there, looking up at him. He tapped me. Tapped me on my face. He said, Hey, you want to make my team? I said, Yeah. He says, Go out there tonight and make two tackles on a special team. I'm going to keep you. If you make two tackles. He told me that. He told me that. <laughs> <laughs> just make two. Yeah. You, you gonna do this? Like, 
<laughs> so Clarence David's elbow me on my side, you know what I mean? You got it. Oh, you heard him say that too. Yeah, he heard it because we sitting there, right? You got that kid, you heard it, you hear this. Two tackles. Come on, man. Come on. All right, let's go. All right, let's go. Go out the game. I have four at halftime. All right, I have four. <laughs> so I got my chest out. I go in the second half, man. But I get a hell of a block. I'll get a block. Rick Jen and take that block and rush that thing back on punt, punt return. I get a hell of a block. Block three guys. Bang, 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 bang. I block my guy, knock him down. Go get another one. Hit him, knock him down. Go get another one, knock him down. Uh, Rick Jen returning for a touchdown. Remember, we scored a touchdown. Man, we sitting out there, man. I'm saying, oh man, I think I don't know. I, I hope I made it. I don't know. Oh, I hope I made it. I don't know. Yeah, that's, so, a, that's a that's a tough feel. I, I, I finished the game. I finished the game with six tackles, right? Six six tackles. Like you no, know, I don't know. You don't, you, don't know. Know. you don't know that series. You know what I mean? All right. So now we fly back up to Oakland. Game's over. We fly back up to Oakland. We got to go to the office. Go to the office. Girl coming in. Hey, Coach Davis. Uh, Coach Madden want to see you, Terry. Bring your playbook. Okay. All right. Okay. Cool. 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 That ain't good. You know that yourself. Hey, bring the playbook. Bring the playbook. You know, you know that ain't good, you know. Okay, good. I get up, I walk in his office. She said, let me have your playbook. I give her the playbook. His secretary, I give her the playbook. Go says the desk. I said, he said, he said, all right. How you doing? You play pretty good, Terry. I was good. I like that. I like that. He said, but let me ask you a question. Your mom and dad, they caught the bus? He said, they believe that. Uh, let me ask you a question. What, what's y'all plan? What's the plan? Uh, what, what's your... I said, well, the plan is that if... Uh, if I get cut, if you cut me today. Go to get a bus with you, man. No, no, if they cut me, I'm going to get in my little Vegas station. Oh, you get to get your Vegas. Yeah, take everybody I'm going to drive down to L.A. with all my stuff in my little Vegas. I'm going to drive down to L.A. I'm going to pick them up, and then we're going to drive drive home together. And he said, well, what, what what, if I don't cut you today? I said, well, if you don't cut me, they're going to get on a Greyhound bus and go back home. $39.95, they're going to go back home. You know? And he says, oh, my God, okay. All right. He said, okay, go see Cheryl, my secretary. Go over there and see her. Uh, She's going to talk to you. I said, all right, John, okay, all right. I shook his hand. You don't know what, what, he didn't say nothing. He didn't say nothing. He didn't say nothing. So I got up, I walked to her desk. So when I got to her desk, she said, hey, okay, all right, hey, hey, hold on. Here, this is for you. So she gave me an envelope, right? And I'm like, okay, you know, I'm thinking that's my walking papers, you know. So I start walking and she said, you open it? Yeah, okay, I open it. Look at it, she says, anyway, Coach Madden said, any guy whose parents could catch a Greyhound bus from New Orleans to LA, that guy's got to be on my football team. He made the team. <laughs> you made the team, and that's when I found out from John Madden. I made the team. You know what I mean? And, and uh, it was the most incredible thing, man. It was the greatest feeling in the world. Uh, Al Davis called me, you know, and uh, and I think had Al Davis. Al Davis called me, man, give me the biggest hug, the biggest kiss. You know, he was so proud and so happy, and I proved him right. You know, I could I could play. But, but, but I mean. just think, <clears throat> anybody listening to this story, the great Terry will be seen. Mm -hmm. In here that you sweated it, sweating, mm -hmm. right. sweating bullets, yeah. just, to hope to to make just hope to make it. Just hope to make it. The Oakland Raiders. That's right. Who would have thought that? Right? Nobody. And I certainly wouldn't have thought it because, again, I just thought that it was they draft you, you're on the team, you wait two, three years till this guy retired, and then you start playing. I mean, that's how. You know, it's like you know, same thing. You know, it's like Sugar Bowl. You know, he came into the freshman, he got to wait till I finish, then he gonna take over. Charles Alexander came into the freshman, great player. He got to wait a year or two, and then when I finished, he takes over. And that's what I thought it is. You know what I mean? I didn't know you had to go make the team. You know what I mean? Yeah, just but, think, Charlie. Yeah. Yeah, just think, yeah, Charlie. Yeah, I mean, you got to get right. back to Charlie. But right. just think how you. Mm -hmm. I mean, people sitting here like, this uh, is the top player in the country. Absolutely. I mean, you to me, he worried about making the team. team. Trying to make the team. But you, you, to you, make you did. Trying to make the team. Your mom and dad probably had a lot to do with you making that team. No question. In, in a way. No question. No question. Because he was. No question. He didn't need no more running backs. No. no. But he needed special team. He needed special team. He needed special team players. See what I'm saying? So when and that was the biggest thing. You know, Clarence Davis had more than other than Al Davis. Clarence Davis had more than more to do with me making the team than anybody in my life. Clarence Davis, because Clarence Davis is the guy that took me under his wing and trained me and made me come to his room and study and learn and teach me. And then Clarence Davis, the guy. Go play special team. Now after that, the fact that Clarence Davis stood me up in that room in the cafeteria and hugged me and kissed me, everybody in that room loved me. Everybody in that room loved me. And all them guys that won that Super Bowl in uh, 1977 that fell in love with me, you can call every one of them the day when you hang up this phone with me, you can call every one of them and tell you how much you love me. The same guy, Freddie Belitnikoff, Clarence Davis, uh, Phil Villapiano, Ma, uh, 
Marvin yeah. Rashford. Yeah, Jack Tatum too. Jack Tatum, Jack Tatum, Jack yeah, Tatum, George yeah. Anderson, um, every one of them guys. You could call Freddie Belinikoff right now. Get off his microphone and call him and say, "Hey, Rubisky, you say I love that man." Uh, all them guys, Raymond Chester, Raymond Chester, All Pro, one of the best tight ends to ever play the game. Raymond Chester would take me out after practice every day and go and put me on these drills and drill me and drill me and drill me and drill me. And, drill me. and he's like, Terry, when you get your chance, you're going to be ready. When they put you out there, you're going to be ready. And Freddie Belinda go, Clarence, uh, Raymond Chester would teach me how to teach me all kind of drills, catching drills and do this and do that. Catch it this way. Run your route this way. Freddie Belinda would teach, teach me how to run routes. Set him up this way. Set Marsh Bradshaw. Them guys yeah. spend that kind of time. Them guys with spend you. all their time, man, with me. You know what I mean? And listen, I ended up getting hurt. Nobody could ever prepare for that. My second year, I ended up tearing up my knee. Had knee surgery. In my first two, three years in the league, I had five knee surgeries. You know, I'm done. But I hung in there. I went to the Miami Dolphins. I got cut by the Raiders. And Al said, "Terry, I got to cut you." Tell you what he told me. Terry, I gotta let you go, man. He said, you just, you just keep getting hurt, it's unfortunate, but that knee just won't hold up, so I'm gonna have to cut you. He said, but don't worry about it. He said, you my guy. He said, I'm gonna cut you, but I'm gonna bring you back. He said, I'm gonna bring you back, and one day we're gonna work together. He cut me, we hugged me, kissed, and I walked out the room. I got signed, I'm a free agent, I got signed by the Miami Dolphins. I went down there, I'm with one of my old roommates, A.J. Dewey now. A.J. Dewey loved me, took care of me. A.J. Dewey, I tell people, was always a a bigger, a better man than me. I couldn't have done what AJ Dewey did for me. Yeah. I couldn't have done for nobody. I couldn't have done that. You know what I mean? AJ was, was my dude, man. And that was my roommate. And uh, I went down to Miami. I played for the Dolphins. You know how I made the team? I became the third down back. I couldn't beat out Delvin Williams. I couldn't beat out Tony Nate. But I could beat him on third down. Because Freddie Belinda had taught me how to run route. Uh, Maurice Bradshaw had taught me how to run route. Uh, Raymond Chester had taught me how to catch that ball. How to shake and, 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 and that's before you running backs was used as wide receiver. Wide receiver. You see what I'm saying? So when I got to Miami, they started using me more as a pass catcher. And then I became the third down back because a guy named Bob, Bob Greasy loved me. Bob Greasy fell in love with me. Bob Greasy said, y'all got to keep that man. That man's got to be here. So I stayed there with the Dolphins. I got in two more years, which gave me five years. I got my pension. But now I had hurt my knee again. Boom, got hurt again. But in Miami, I broke my back. Broke your back? I broke three balls in my back. So when I ended up breaking my back in the game, I broke my back in the same how, how did you break your back? Uh, safety. Uh, linebacker grabbed me, jumped on me. I'm dragging him, pulling away, trying to pull away from him. And he pulls me Ooh. that way and tries to stop me from getting the end zone. The safety kind of hit the right square in the back of my back. Okay. Broke three balls in my back. We broke my bones. In. We broke the bones, three bones. We broke them in the second quarter. We shot it up at halftime. You know about those. So we shot it up and had sent you back out there? I went back out and played the rest of the game. I went back out and played the rest of the game. And uh, you know, had a great had a great time. But anyway, now I retired. I, I got hurt. Said now I got retired. Al Davis called me. Same guy called me. And he said, Hey Terry, uh, what's your plan? You wanna try to get well and go back and play again? He said, I'm getting ready to move my team from Oakland to Los Angeles. I got a lot of coaches that didn't want to go with me. So I'm gonna have some opening. He said, if you think you want to coach. He said, I can help you. I'm going to give you a job and I'm going to train you. He said, because you got a brilliant mind for football. He says, and uh, there's something about you that I love. But you know what that is? Your heart. He said, you care. I love you. Yeah. He says, so if you want to come work, I'm going to give you a job. I said, I'll be there. I'm going to come. <laughs> and this was Tuesday, he called me. He so, flew me in Thursday. So you became an NFL coach. Two days after, after I got, got cut, cut from playing. From Two days after I got cut from playing. Uh, I got cut on a Tuesday. I flew to o uh, Santa Rosa, California on Thursday. Sat out and met with him. He shook my hand. He gave me a hug, gave me a kiss. And he said, go to work. I got up and went to work. And he didn't was, offer me no contract. It was 81, 82. That was 1981. Mm -hmm. And uh, he didn't say, hey, I'm going to give you this. I'm going to pay you this. and I'm going to interview you this. Give me a resume. He says, I'm hiring you. He said, go to work. And I got up and walked out of his office. And that was 47 years ago. No, coaching wise that's 42 years ago and uh that's a lot of years ago but that's i tell people that is 42 years ago that's about 1300 games ago 1300 games ago and uh i've never missed a day i've never missed a game i've never missed a practice mm -hmm. in 42 years of coaching i've never missed a practice 
I've never missed a day and I've never missed a game. Something just crossed my mind. And I guess that's why I'm in the NFL Hall of Fame. Yes, NFL Hall of Fame. Okay. My last NFL game, you remember that game? Do you remember that game? Mm -hmm. We played the Oakland Raiders in Atlanta. What we beat y'all by? Y'all got, got lucky. Y'all got lucky. Beat it. Got lucky. They 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 they, they had me on the outside, and my 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 knee was bothering me. Uh -huh. And so I told him before the game started, my something was going on with my knee. But they put me back out there. They put me out there anyway. That's right. That's right. And at halftime, they said, "I said, well, don't you see? I can't really right. protect myself." Right. So they moved me inside because I played. I was inside and outside. I got you. So they moved me inside after halftime. Got you. And that boy, Big Muno. Muno. Uh huh. What was that? What was that? Yeah. Oh no, Munoz. Muno. Yes. I'm at inside yeah. linebacker, yeah. Big Muno, because we came out the draft the yeah. same year. Yeah. Big Muno coming straight at me. Marcus yeah. Allen behind. Yeah. I'm seeing what's happening. Yeah. My knees. My, I know I don't have to strip, so right. I just drop. Marcus Allen just go right around me, yeah. run the ball right down to the <laughs> five two yard line, yeah. right yeah. to the five two yard line. Yeah. They take me out of the game. They mad at me. They mad at you. After the game, you walk up to me. I said, man, what's going on? He was all right, huh? You asked me that question. Yeah. You said you all right, huh? I said uh, we kept run we kept running you away because we saw that yes. that something was going on yeah. with you. Yeah. I'm saying, well, if you saw that, yeah. why my why yeah. Atlanta yeah. couldn't see that? Yeah, and that was the biggest thing. That's like I told you when I broke my back, they put me back in. Mm -hmm. you know I mean, they put you back in. They 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 think it, you know, and that's just the way coaching in that's football. That's the start. That's stupid part of it. You know where they they say it's a difference between being hurt and being injured. You know, <laughs> I mean, we, we as coaches, you know, don't understand mm -hmm. that, but. And that's what people, and I think that's a little bit of what's different in football today. Oh, yeah, you know a whole mean? lot different. Yeah, because again, we 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 as coaches back then expect that our day was training. If we see a weakness in you, we find your weakness. We come in. We exploit you. We come in. If we see, and the, and the worst part in the world, man, is especially the way today the they report everything. You know, if your name is on that injury report for a bad, a bad ankle, a sprained ankle, a high ankle sprain, mm -hmm. and they put you out there. We're looking for you. We're going we to find out if it's a high <laughs> ankle. And that, listen, when I was a running back coach, like we talked about, you know, Harrison Francis, you know, if they said, uh, if they come out and said, um, you know, oh yeah, Lyman pulled his hamstring, he tweaked his hamstring last week, we don't know if he's going to play. I promise you, the first two, three games, you're going to have to go cover him full speed down the left sideline. We're going to find out if your hamstring's okay. Yeah, you know what I mean? So the worst thing they can do is give us our injury report saying. So, so you, you use that. Ain't no question. question. Ain't no question. We're so going to put it to test. We're going to put it to test. We're going to find out if he's healthy and he's ready to go. Now, if you if you didn't play and they put your cousin Tony behind you, we're going to find out if Tony can play. We're going to get Tony. We come and get that spot. You know what I mean? okay. So when they took you from when they took you from one spot and put you inside the mic, they put you from mic and put you to the wheel, they didn't do you no justice. We we, gonna find, we got plays to come in. You know, we got plays to come because in. Because y'all kept coming by coming at you. But you after the mean? game, you walked up yeah. to me. Yeah. And you said, man, what's you, you all right, huh? Yeah. Yeah. I said, man, we kept running you away because yeah. we saw him with. We saw it. I mean, me, but y'all didn't know to what degree right. what was going That's on. That's exactly right. We just y'all yeah. kept running. Yeah. And way. we knew that you kept protecting it. You know, we knew you was you know getting out of low, putting your shoulder in there to protect it. So your mind is, I'm gonna plug this thing up to protect it. You know, see somebody come. But you didn't have no, you didn't have no strength to push off. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah. that couldn't explode. So couldn't explode. I mean, That's exactly so right. That, that's, they that's come exactly. up the hole, but I That's can't do that. But fold over exactly. yes. and big Muno coming. That's, that's right. Well, how big was Muno? He was three ten, I believe. Yeah, he was I think six, about six, six, <laughs> about six, six four. Six four, three six, ten. Six four, about three ten. Yeah, yeah. so he know. coming at me like, oh yes. man. Yeah, yeah. That, we, they, pull, they pulled me out yeah. after that. That's the last play. That you played. I played. Wow. Against wow. the Oakland Raiders. That's yeah. the last NFL game wow. I played. That's crazy. Get, and you was on the side. Yes. Over that's there. crazy. That's you crazy. walked up after the game. And you yeah. asked me that question. Yeah. Were you okay? You yeah. Yeah. Are you okay? Yeah. That's why we come at you. It, it wasn't that I didn't like you. I mean, I liked you. You were born, you know what I mean? But I got to make this money. You know, I got to get paid. Money. Yeah. But, you know what I mean? But now let's talk about that transition that you coached long enough in the NFL where they, they were teaching you to knock the block out. Knock the knock the job, knock money the job mm -hmm. strap. Right. I mean, I mean, big right. basic. Go yeah. knock. We would say literally knock that quarterback out. Take yeah. him out the game. Knock the snot out of his nose. You not can't, you can't use them terminology no more. Them terminology. They, they, you get put in jail. Exactly right. You them. can't use that no more. Them so, things are gone. So how was, how did how did you adjust to that? I never did. You never did. I never did. That's why I'm sitting here with you today. You know, I just, <laughs> uh, you know, I just retired. Um, they just, I just retired. 
Uh, and again, you know, I coached again. I coached for 42 years, so it was a long time. 42 years in the NFL. 42 years in the NFL coach. You coached with every team in the NFL. Right? I coached with a bunch of them. I coached with a bunch of them. <laughs> sure. But uh, I coached for 42 years, and um, uh, my my last year was in Jacksonville, uh, and I took uh, I took a walk on free agent guy that nobody knew, a running back, a walk on free agent guy. Uh, I was in Jacksonville with uh, Leonard Fournette, another great you know LSU guy. And had a great time. My first year with Leonard, uh, Leonard had some almost close to 2,000 yard rushing and receiving. It was all purpose back for us. They had a phenomenal year. And then they got in the contract squabble. They traded him, let him go, cut him, let him go. And uh, I took a walk on free agent guy named Jane Robinson. I uh, took that guy off the street. Nobody knew him. I didn't know him. Shit. I didn't know him. <laughs> Doug Marone was the guy that said, let's get him. And I took him. And um, man, look, the guy was running out for rookie of the year. You know, but uh, it just got to a point that I just, I never could really get used to, I certainly never got comfortable with today's coaching. You know, I couldn't get used to uh, telling the guy, don't don't go in there and knock the guy head off. I couldn't get used to. That, that could come out the mouth. Like, yeah, I, I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't, I just couldn't get used to that. You, you know? How else can you coach? Yeah, you know what I mean? And I'm like, how do you coach football? And don't tell him. That aggressive, to, aggressive. Yeah, you know, like you, you know, I mean, hey man, you gotta hit this guy. We trying to kill him. You can't say that no more. You know, I mean, Terry, oh, you can't say that to me. Okay, whatever. Man, listen, you gotta go in there, and I and I would tell my receivers, or I'll tell you, listen, man, you go over there and cut his balls off. <laughs> Terry, you can't say that no more. Terry, you can't say that no more. You know what I mean? And, and I would say stuff, man, and, and 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 you know, people, but but I would say, if I want a guy to play violent, I gotta coach violent. I mean, I you know I can't I can't be coaching passive and think suddenly they blow the whistle he's gonna be a violent player. And my life was you know time was you got to be you got to be an angry person man you got to be violent you know and I tell my guys all the time unless that guy across from you is your cousin or your roommate we gonna kill that son of a bitch. <laughs> I mean and I'm dead and I tell all my guys hey man look the door is open you know if you ain't in here to kill you need to leave because we here we here to kill we we. We ain't here trying to be nice to him. You can hug him after the game, but when we line up against him, we're going to... You, you, you got to take him out. You got to take him out. And I tell him all the time. And I started, and, I, and I've always coached that way. My guys will tell you, I would always tell them, here's what we're going to do. Fullback. I want you to get on low. And that linebacker that's up there peeping to see what that ball carries. Explode. Get on low and explode. And I used to do explosion drill. And I said, hey, now here's what I need you to do. I need you to take the crown of that hat and put it right here under his chin. And if you get out low enough, and if you hit it with a pop and explode, you gonna knock his helmet off, and you gonna knock him out. And to prove that, I had a film, and I still got it on my computer somewhere. I had a film. Where I had one of my guys go in there and drop his hips, and roll his hips, and come down under and hit a guy. And he hit him, and he knocked that guy's helmet. Boom! Knock his helmet off. That guy helmet was up in the air. The guy wobbled and shake and looked up and caught his helmet. And he was dizzy as hell. Two plays later, he took him out. You know what I mean? Look, look, but but, but listen, you, you, you were proud of that, though. I, I love it. I, what I just told you, I still got it on my computer today. I've been retired three years, and I still got it on my computer today. And I tell my wife, when I die, I put that in my casket. I want this play in my casket. You know? And I got one. This, this is what football's supposed to be this about. This is what all about. I got another one. When people want to question it, and I don't know this, that. And I tell my guys all the time, the day you think it don't work, call me. I'm going to show it to you. And I got another one. I can go get the film. I'm in that same Atlanta you talk about. I'm in Atlanta. I'm, I'm assistant head coach. I'm coaching Atlanta. I'm over there coaching. I'm coaching the running back. There's a guy named Michael Turner who's a ball carrier. He carries the ball, but he's our best pass protector. We're playing the Baltimore, Baltimore Ravens. Mike, here's what we're going to do. And Mike was a little squatty body like Harrison Ford, squatty body. Harrison Francis. Uh, Harrison Francis. A little squatty body, big thick legs, big thick ass. That's, that's what I'm looking for. <laughs> Power, power, man, power. Explosive power. My, Mike goes in there, man, and drop them hips, like I teach him on that dummy. Woo! Drop them hips, man, and when Mike rolled that thing, he hit a guy named Ray Lewis. Oh, right. The linebacker, the great Ray the Lewis. The great, the greatest. <laughs> hit Ray, Ray wobbled, <laughs> and the doctors come got him. <laughs> He wobble, they go to that wobble, wobble, baby, wobble, baby. Wobble, 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 wobble,
the doctors come got it. And the next thing you know what happens next, right? You sit on that bench, they get that smell of sauce, and they do their finger. One, two, three, four. He done, he ain't coming back. He down for the count. Huh? That, that's what the coach looking for, right? <laughs> that's what I'm looking for. And I tell all my guys, listen, if Roddy White can do this, if Michael Turner can do this, you can do it too. And I tell him, you know how much Michael Turner was making when he did that hit? He was making four and a half million dollars. You know how much Roddy, Roddy White was making when he hit that? Three and a half million dollars. You know how much you make? Three thousand. Now you make a bill high. You want to stay at 3000 you want to make $3 million. I'm not sure what to do to make $3 million. You know what I mean? <laughs> but just think, the, those days of coaching it's gone. are gone. gone. So football is a passive sport? There ain't no question. The, now, your cr the crown of your head can cause you really to be out of the league. No question. Absolutely. That was the key Absolutely. teaching yes. of a defensive player. No question. And yes. everybody, really. Absolutely. The yeah. running back, the, uh, the line was everybody got to use the crown. Got to help. Got to use the crown, man. Not to say you cannot you can't use. use. You can't use the crown. Man. And if you use it, if you use it, they flag you. First they flag you, then they find you, then they suspend you. So if you want to play, if you want to stay, you got to use it. So, so you got to hit so, the face mask. Got to hit with the face mask. Yeah. Yeah. Back in them days, what, 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 what? <laughs> face mask. No. You know, we, we ain't got no uh, assistance out here. There's no, no face mask. No face mask. No kissing. We out here kissing nobody. <laughs> we out here killing people, man. We in the crowd out here, man. You know what I mean? So these days, in time. So what what, what happened to the foot? To, I mean, we know what the, the question is. You got to first explain to us what happened to the full banks. You, you, you got to tell them that to the fullbacks. Full, the fullbacks became dinosaurs. And they became dinosaurs because you can't go lead block on people like that anymore. And you know, that was a fullback's oh, job. Okay, you know, the fullback's right, job right. was to go in there and root them up. And, you know, and especially when you get to them third and two, third and one, third and two, third and two. Or you give them that goal line. You know, first and goal from the four. Put that fullback in the hey man, go take that middle line back out. Knock him out of there. Marcus Allen would dive over the top. Hey man, listen, they're getting down low. I need you to dive. Hit that guy right under his chin. Mark is gonna dive over the top. We're gonna to get a touchdown. Yeah, because you can't sit him in there with your shoulder. You, you come come no. back, the shoulder gonna be broke. Bro, bro, you know, don't be going in there with your shoulder turning sideways. No, no. Hit the crown, man. Take your crown, hit him right in the face, man. Put that right in his mouth. You know what I mean? And uh, you know, now like I said, as the game has changed, they don't want no fullbacks no more because fullback, that's all we knew. Fullbacks knew how to we our job is to kill people. Go in there and get them out the way. And like you said, you know, big moon you'll come and hit you. And that guy was coming to hit you to get you out of the way so Marcus could pass. Now the fullback was going to do that. You know, that guard blocked down, that fullback's coming in there. But nobody wants to play football that way no more. Nobody wants to see fullbacks killing nobody no more. So fullback's going to the wayside, man. But today football is just, I don't know if you watched the Pro Bowl or if any of your fans watched the Pro Bowl last year. Pro Bowl Las Vegas was flag football. I don't know if y'all saw it. But they played flag football. Everybody had a flag and they were putting their flags. Oh, for real? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, right now, flag it, football. it was a flag football game. Go back and pull it up and look at it. It was a flag. They had gym shorts and t-shirt on. And uh, I don't even know if they, had, they didn't even have, have helmet. They had uh, the game. And listen to me. Let me explain something else to you. The guys that won the game, the winning team, got $80,000 a man. And they played flag football. They had baseball caps on. They had red shirts and red shorts and flag football. And that's what they played. And, you know, that's what football is becoming. You know, but listen. That's what the fans enjoy. They enjoy all the no, no, five no, wides no, and open up, you know. As no, long as they're paying for long it, they're paying. Who that, That's exactly right. You know what I mean? Long as the, the lease and loan that thing keep making that money and we keep people keep paying for it, let it go. Let it keep going, you know. And uh, the game has just changed to that point. You know, the days of the, the Woody Hayes and uh, Bo Shimblank and them guys, them days are gone. You know what I mean? Hand that ball over, man. Run that thing 40 times a game. Control the clock, you know. Them games are the games going. And myself and you know, when I went to the Raiders, you know, like I said, being LSU, all this and all that, I went to the Raiders, they moved me to fullback. And Mark Van Egan was the guy who So now you got Harrison Phil. I know how Harrison Phil. You know what I mean? I know how Harrison Phil. You know I mean? But I was ready for it because I wanted to make that money. I wanted to make but that you're getting money. paid now. I'm getting, so paid. Getting, I'm getting paid now. You know what you, I mean? You, you, who, hey, I, don't I, I don't want to go back to Egan. No. Uh -huh. I, I go visit my mom, my dad. That's right. But I'm getting paid. You know? and, and listen, I'm, I'm making $18,000 a year. I'm getting paid yeah, good. That was big money back then. $18,000. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm the 70s. Yeah. You know, I got an $8,000 signing bonus. Uh, I went and bought my little Vegas station wagon for 2800 you know. A new car, you know, for twenty eight hundred, and I'm making eighteen thousand dollars a year, man. Come on, let's go, man. This is this is rocking and rolling. I'm, 
I'm big time. I'm LeBron James. Shit. I'm making money. Bro. I'm voting money. You know. What I mean? And you, you in the big yeah. Cal- Cali. You in Cali now. You in Cali. I'm in California with the world champs. I ain't just in Cali. I'm in Cali with the world champ. You know, this is man. This is big stuff. And, and, and your second year of coaching, you won a championship. Oh uh, no, we ended up winning. Uh, not the second year. The second year they went to uh, it was '82. The league went on strike. Oh, it's strike year. Yeah, the strike year, and then the Redskins won it. And then we come up in '83, and uh, we won it. We won it. It was the '83 season. It was right. the '84 Super Bowl, and we ended up winning that now, one. Now you yeah. also coached a, a couple of LSU players in the early '80s. John Adams, mm-hmm. uh, uh, defensive end. Uh huh. Uh huh. John didn't we had, that. I long. think we might have moved the might have moved the linebacker, but John came in. John, I don't remember what happened. John was very very smart and very talented, but I think he the same thing. Boy, he speed. Got, he <laughs> might he might have got hurt. He might have got injured. Uh, and, and then we had a tackle, an offensive tackle we signed. I don't remember his name, but we had signed an offensive tackle from uh, LSU. And um, he had come from LSU. He was very, very talented, great feet, great feet, great hands. And boy, everybody just said, boy, he got a chance, boy, he got a chance. But he was just one of those that uh, he, 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 he just wouldn't put his face in there. <laughs> he wouldn't put his face in there. He fit right in today. Yeah, he fit in today. He'd been a great player today. He'd been a great player today. He'd be all, all he, world, world today. All world yeah, today. But yeah. back then, no, you couldn't, you couldn't be with us. Particularly with you. You couldn't be with us back then. I mean, then. Al David epitomized, yes. Yes. I, mean, I don't want to use the word violence. You know, you can use violence. If you don't use it, I'm going to use it. <laughs> because yeah, I mean, that, that's really what the, man, the people scared to play right now. Absolutely. Because y'all DBs was killing people. Killing people. Killing people. Clotheslining people, hitting them in the head, knocking them out, uh, leading in there with the helmets, leading in there with the head, you know. And you know, the, 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 the world talks. The world talks about Jack Tatum. You know, Jack Tatum hit Daryl Stingley. You know, when he paralyzed him, and the, the world talk about him. You know, yeah. it's a shame. You know, and it's a shame. But let, let me tell you something. When Jack Tatum hit uh, in the Super Bowl, when Jack Tatum hit my homeboy Sammy White. You know what I mean, Sammy. Sammy saw stars too, you know what I mean? And uh, they, they was just, were, he was coming. He was, he was, he was, he was crazy. I mean, but, man. But, uh, that, but that was the game. You that, know, that, that was the game. You coached 42 years in the NFL. 42 years in the NFL. And you had two interim head coaches. I, I had three, three, but people don't know I had three. I'm the only guy in the history of football that's been an interim head coach three times. And who who you was interim coach? I took over for about uh, ten days with the Raiders. And after, after who? Archell was there, no, Art was there, and then Art went to the hospital. And uh, the ten, eight or ten days he left training camp with the hospital, I ran everything. I was, you know, acting head coach. And then I went to uh, the Washington Redskins, and when I was there with the Redskins, uh, I ended up being the head coach there for the last three games, and uh, won my last game. Another one of those times I won the last <clears> game, and uh, the owner told me he's going to give me the head job. Um, and uh, we shook hands and we agreed and he agreed I was going to be the head coach but he promised me he had to do a friend a favor and interview one of the <coughs> other guys and he interviewed uh, Marty Schottenheimer <laughs> and Marty and the guy that he was with convinced him that I wasn't the man for the job that Marty was and Marty Schottenheimer was a great coach was you know really can't take that from he was a great coach you know, he was a better coach you know I, I would have done better for him I know that for sure because Marty came in lasted a, like a year or two and uh, but I, I had the pulse of that team I had a I had the heartbeat of that team. And Washington was you a know, good place to be. Washington was a very good place. A very good place. We had good players. We had signed a lot of guys, you know. But I, I, I took over. And listen, I took over. i uh, show you how crazy it was. I took over. The week I took over, we went to Dallas. And, and I took it over. And I think we played in Dallas on a Thursday. Uh, it was a short week. And we played Dallas in Dallas with Bill Parcell. You know, and halftime it was 15 to 12. We were in it. And then they come out and made a couple plays on us, and uh, we fumbled it, and then uh, they took off and beat us, you know. But listen, you know, we went, like they say, we went from the uh, frying pan to the skillet, I guess. We, 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 we played Dallas in Dallas, which was Bill Parcel. Uh, in Dallas, we lost. Then next week, Saturday, right? Saturday, not even Sunday. Saturday, we lose a day of practice. We got to go to Three River Stadium to play the Pittsburgh Steelers. And let me tell you what's crazy about that one. Like, we go to Three River Stadium. And we playing uh, Bill Cower and the Pittsburgh Steelers. You know what I mean? And listen, we get there. Uh, it's the last game ever. The last game ever played at Three River Stadium. I'm the opposing coach. I'm coaching the. I'm coaching there. I'm coaching the Washington Redskins. Last game ever played. I'm coaching the Redskins, and we playing them guys. And same thing, man. Halftime, the score is uh, ten to three. 
and then they come out the second half and we threw an interception, they scored, and we dropped the punt, I believe, and uh, they ended up beating us. You know, so we got the Dallas Cowboys in Dallas, we got the Pittsburgh Steelers in Pittsburgh, last game ever, Terry Bradshaw is there, you know, uh, Franco Harris is there. Oh, man, no, All them ghosts, yeah. all them old ghosts is there, and I remember walking out on the field, I remember walking out on the field, and uh, and uh, we walk on the field. They got all the all them ghosts standing, all them old great players, man, greatest players in the history. And I remember uh, Franco, hey, hey, Biscay, Biscay, uh, hey, uh, good luck. I'm pulling for you, but we gonna beat your ass. We gonna beat your ass. Yeah, no. and they did. You know, they did. They beat us, but it was just you know good. And then the last game of the year, we went back to D.C. and finished up the last game, and we played the Carolina Panthers, and I think we ended up beating them 22 to 10 or something. We won the game, you know. And then, like I said, the owner came and I met with him in the locker room, went up to his suite, smoked cigars, had a glass of champagne, and he said, Terry, I'm happy to make you the head coach. I'm going to let you be the head coach and you're going to be my guy. So, yeah, it'd be a great feeling. Yeah, it was fantastic. It was fantastic. I felt like I had made it. Now, I went you go tell your family. Tell my wife. You know, I ain't told nobody about my wife. And I told her, I said, let's keep it to ourselves. Don't tell our kids. Don't tell anybody anything. Let's wait until I sign and they ain't dry, you know. So, uh, you know, bam, bam, that happened. And then he got up, the owner got up that Tuesday morning, and uh, uh, he, he told me, I'm going to tell you what he said. He said, hey, he said, I'm going I'm to I'm give you the job. He said, but I've got two, three guys I've got to talk to, because I promised him I was going to talk to him. I said, who you talk to? You know, who the guy? He said, Steve Spurrier, Bill Parcell. You know, <laughs> now you got to live there with that. Yeah, you know, and he said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, but you're going to yeah. give me the job? You know? He said, yeah, I'm going to give you the job. I'm going to give you the job. I said, yeah, well, that makes sense. I said, them guys ain't coming to work for you. Damn, them guys will never work for you. I said, you're paying the ass. And he started laughing, you know. And he says, uh, and he says, and this is like 2003 or something. And he says, uh, uh, Terry, um, uh, I'm offering them $6 million a year. I said, what? You're offering $6 million a year? I said, damn, for $6 million a year? You can dig up Vince Lombardi. He come back. <laughs> Vince will come back and go for $6 million. Holy shit. Nobody had ever heard of nothing like that. No, $6 million a year. Head coach was making a million, five million, six. He go off him six million dollars a year. I said, wow. So I said, it don't matter. Bill ain't coming to work for you. Jimmy ain't coming to work for you. Steve ain't going to work for you. So the next day, you know, he got up Monday, missed some phone call. Jimmy Johnson told him no. Bill Parcell told him no. And then his partner, Pepper, Pepper Rogers, convinced him to fly to Florida. Uh, Come on, we'll fly with you to Florida. Then we're going to go meet with Steve Spurry. And they, but they, it was strange, you know, because Steve Spurry was in Gainesville. And they flew down to like Jacksonville, Florida. I'm like, why is he going to Jacksonville? You know? Well, Steve down there playing golf. Oh, okay. Right. And they told me that Steve was like at Sawgrass somewhere playing golf. They went there to meet him. But when they got there, Steve wasn't there. He didn't show up. So it happened. So Marty Schottenheimer was there having lunch. So it was all set up. Oh, see? Yeah. So they set him up. So he sat out of the room, had lunch with Marty Schottenheimer. And between him and Pepper, they convinced me in that, you know, hey, Marty, this is Marty's job. Marty Schottenheimer. That, that, that's, that's the way the game is played. That's the way the game is played. You know, and it happened to me twice. It didn't happen to me once. It happened to me twice because. You know, I was there, and Marty came in, and of course, I knew Marty from my days with the Raiders. He was with the Chief. You know, what I mean, and I, I, you know, as a as an enemy, I hated him, and he, I guess, he didn't like me because I was with the Raiders, and we hated Kansas City. You know what I mean? So he came in, and then he fired me, and then when he fired me, I got hired to go to Cleveland. So uh, Bush Davis hired me to go with him. I was the first guy he hired. So Bush hired me. I went with Bush to Cleveland. Boom! I'm in Cleveland for two, three years with Bush Davis, and then. Uh, Butch ended up getting fired, and when Butch got fired then, uh, I took over as interim head coach then, you know, so there's five games left, and I took over as the interim head coach then, and, you know, same thing, we fought our butt off, man, and we was in some games, and New England beat us, and Buffalo beat us, and we went to Miami and played in close on Sunday Night Football, San Diego came to the place and beat us, and the last game of the year, we went to Houston, and Houston's, uh, this is sitting there, I think it was uh, seven and eight, uh, Houston sitting at seven and eight, and if they win the game, they go to eight and eight, they go to the playoff. You know, and we sitting here, we two and thirteen or something like that. You know, and it's uh, I think it's the day before New Year's. The airplane is full of people. We got people we took with us. We got guests we took with us. And man, look, we went out there and our players played so hard. It was unbelievable, man. And I'm telling you, we sitting there and the clock is counting down in six seconds. The seconds that we didn't beat them twenty. I think it's twenty-seven to ten. We didn't beat them. We we about to beat them. The clock's running. Uh, me and my players coming over, pick me up, carry me like we won the Super Bowl. Guys are crying. And they're so happy for me. You know. And then we go to the locker room, we dancing on top of the table, we having a yeah, great time. We're having a great time. We celebrating like we won the Super Bowl, man, because the guys had played five games for me. And we had played all five games hard as hell, man. I mean, we were fighting our ass off every game, man. We were fighting, man, it was hard. 
the guys was dying for me. You know what I mean? Guys, you know, guys, oh, oh Terry, we think he broke his finger, you know. And he tip it up. I'm going back in. You know, oh, we, you know, we, we, we two and 15. You know, why, why they want to play? You know, guys playing for me. You know, hey, Terry, he sprained his ankle. He said, well, shoot it up. Okay, okay, shoot it. Guys out there playing, man, late, dragging, man. But when we play it, you know, we play it hard. You know, but we won the last game, you know. And then same thing, you know, Randy learned to say, hey, Terry, you know, but this is unbelievable. I can't believe what these players did. You know. We get on the airplane going back, and we had probably had maybe 100 sponsors came in again. This is the day before New Year's. We 2 and 13, sponsors coming out of the flight. We get back on the plane going back to Cleveland, man. The sponsors still give me a stand ovation. Bah, 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 bah. Oh, wow. You know. Okay, great. You know. So Dan comes in my office. You know, hey, you the man. You the man for this job. I'm going to give you this job. You know, Terry, this is great, man. You're going to be the guy. You're going to be the head coach. But uh, I got two guys I got to talk to. He said, I got to talk to Russ Grimm. And I promised his agent I was going to be I said, well, I'm not worried about Russ Grimm. I hired Russ Grimm. I brought him to the league. So, you know, you can't have, you're going to hire Russ Grimm over for me, you know. I said, oh, no big deal. I said, who else you got to tell you? He said, I got to go meet with the commissioner. I said, I'm worried about that son of a bitch. I don't know him. I'm worried about him, you know. And then he flew up to New York and he met with the commissioner. And then when he met with the commissioner, he called me and asked me, can I fly to New York the next day? You want to talk to him? All right. So I flew to New York and he took me to his penthouse on Fifth Avenue. And he said, hey, man, I just did, a, uh, I just did something with the commissioner and I committed. I committed to something that I got to do, and I'm just going to have to hire somebody else. And I said, oh, okay, all right, okay. So I called my guy in the league office and said, hey, man, what's, what's with the commissioner? And why did he talk to that guy to hire me? And he says, oh, he said he wanted to get another guy. And, you know, he, he really wanted to see him hire a black guy, you know, for the job. I said, yeah, well, I'm black, you know. He said, yeah, yeah, but he said somebody else called him about Romeo Cornell. He had to hire Romeo Cornell. Oh, okay. And then come to find out, the commissioner promised the owner from the Browns, if you hire Romeo Cornell, I'm gonna make your team a superstar. I'm gonna put you on three, three prime time games: Sunday night, Monday night, and Thursday night. For the all kind of deals. You know yeah, I mean? yeah. I'm gonna give you 300 more extra Super Bowl tickets. I'm gonna put you on this executive committee. You know, it's like wow, wow, wow. But but basically, to take that team and put them on prime time three times in one year, you know, that that really blows you. That's promotion. You know, what I mean, that's that's selling football. You know, what I mean. So for him to tell him he's going to put his team on Sunday night, Monday night, and Thursday night football was huge. You know, and he said he wanted to do that because he wanted to show the world that the league was capable of having a black, hiring a black head coach. But at the end of the day, what had happened was Romeo Cannell had won more Super Bowl than anybody in football. So when Randy called me, he had to come to New York, and he says, Terry, I'm sorry, i got to hire somebody else. I said, Randy, this is really screwed up. If you're not hiring Romeo Cannell, I don't even want to talk to you. And he looked at me, how do you know? I said, that's the only man in the world I can tell you that deserved a job over me. That man's won five Super Bowl. You know what I mean? So he said, that's what I'm hiring. I said, oh, I didn't know. <laughs> oh, I didn't know. Okay, you know? Yeah, so, uh, you know, the two days, three days later, he hired Romeo. I'm the first guy Romeo called. He said, hey, man, don't you go nowhere. He said, you got to coach for me. You got to be on my staff. You ain't, don't you go nowhere. You ain't going nowhere. Mm -hmm. And I stayed with Romeo. You know, I stayed there with him. And, uh, you know, eventually I ended up leaving. But, uh, you know, that's, that's three times, you know. But look, what's funny is, you know, telling you I, I was the opposing head coach at Three River Stadium. You know, the, the, I coached the last game ever in the history of uh, Three River Stadium with Pittsburgh Steelers. And then uh, again, in like 2019, I'm standing on the sideline. I'm coaching the last game ever played, and I won at the Oakland Coliseum, where I started. Where you started? Where I started, bro. Where I started. I started with the Raiders. They drafted me. Oakland Coliseum, where I started my career. In 2019, they're playing the last game ever played in the yeah. Oakland Coliseum. You just happened and to be played in that game. I happened to be coaching that game. And we won that game. We won that game. And that, yeah. that, that, that you without the style. Yeah, no question. You know, but listen, I tell people all the time, I don't listen. Uh, you know, Coach Mack was, uh, he was what he was. He coached for a long time. Uh, he was a damn good coach. Coach Mack was a damn good coach. I stood on the table for Coach Mack when I left. Um, you know, when I left, the year after I left, they was trying to have, they was on the walk out, they wanted to fire. And uh, he called me and asked me, could I speak up for him? I called the board of supervisors. They had a board of supervisors meeting, and I called them and they put me on a conference call. And I talked to the guys on the board of supervisors and I convinced them to keep him. Oh, man. And they kept him. They kept him for another year or two. So yeah, I, I give him, him for another, no, three. Three years. Yeah, give him three, because yeah. that was my, my, he did for three years. So I, uh, I jumped, I jumped on the table for him. You know, but Jerry Stowall coached you too. Jerry was my running back coach. Yeah. Jerry was my yeah. running back coach. I called for Jerry too. I called Coach Jerry and talked to him. You know, uh, so I was in touch with all those guys. You know, it was great. You know, and I went to listen. I went on to 
I went on to coach in the pros, and like I told you, I coach. Um, you know, I coached there. I coached for 42 years. I won a lot of games. I went to five championship games. I won one. I lost four. You know, uh, LSU called me a lot of years, man, and called me and uh, hey, you ready to come back? You want to want to hire you? Want to come back? Be the head coach? I heard you say a minute ago. You usually go over and uh, do your shows at the Lod Cook Center. Uh -huh. Lod Cook was a very dear friend of mine. Lod Cook and I became very good friends when I was with the Raiders in Los Angeles, won the Super Bowl. I think he was working for Arca, was his company. And uh, I'd go have lunch with Lod Cook all the time. And Lod Cook called LSU when uh, that thing happened with Jerry Bonato. Lod Cook called uh, uh, called uh, the president and said, hey, y'all, it's time to hire Terry Rubisky. He called him personally. I was sitting in his office. It was me and a guy named Robert Bob Dole running for oh, president. Running for president. Right? Oh, we were sitting out in Lod Cook's office having lunch. And Lod Cook picked up the phone because he was talking about Terry. I think it's time for him to shoot a higher black coach. I think it's time for him to shoot bring in a black coach. And Robert Dole said, if you believe that, then pick up the phone and call him. If you believe it, pick up the phone and call him. So Bob Dole told him that. Bob Dole told him that. Bob Dole went on. Told him, hey, if you believe that, if you think that's true, if you believe it, then pick up the phone and call him. You ought to pick up the phone and call him. You donate more money to that school than anybody in the history of football. You ought to call him. He said, all right, I will. He picked up the phone, dialed the number, called the you president. you sitting right here. I'm sitting right there. And he picked up the phone, called the president. And then, you know, I'm with the Redskins. I leave, I go to the Redskins. And then the president eventually called me, and he says, uh, you know, hey, I think it's time we hire a black head coach. If you're ready to come back to be the coach, I'm going to bring you back. And then, uh, boom, 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 I'm up there. I'm at, uh, I'm at the Marriott Hotel, and I interviewed for seven seven hours with a guy named Joe Dean. I mean, Joe Dean sat there and interviewed and interviewed and interviewed, and uh, for seven hours, man, I ever, I answered every question I could answer for him. And he told me he couldn't be the first, he couldn't be the first. Uh, he said, I can't be the first LA director in the SEC history to bring a black coach in. Terry, I just can't do it. Mm -hmm. And I said, he said, I can't do that, Terry, I can't. I said, Joe, you know I was black before you left that Ridge. I said, why the hell did you come? He said, President made me. Oh, so, whoa, yeah. oh, wow, okay, I got you, yeah. And the thing that really shook Joe up, what shook him up was, I think Joe came to do the interview because they asked him to. He didn't, he had no idea how qualified I was. I think when he left Baton Rouge, he had no idea how prepared I was, how long I'd been coaching, and, you know, who I was. He didn't do no, do no, he, no he, research in that. Guy. Yeah, he didn't, he didn't have no idea. And he didn't, he didn't, he didn't expect me to come across the way. Now, I remember, you know, either 94 or 95, I got a call from you that the job was open at LSU. I don't know, it was 94 or 1995. And uh, he said, I need for you to talk to some people. Mm -hmm. And I did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the thing I got, I got a lot of pushback. Right. I, mean, I, I call right. you that you know, but right. I don't right. think this is going to happen. That's right. Two reasons I thought that. Mm -hmm. It was just hard for them to hire mm -hmm. someone that looked like them. Mm -hmm. that, was, that was hard for them to do that. Right. This is the South. This is right. Confederate. It's like we run everything. Right. And the second thing, they was a little afraid of you. Right. <laughs> they, they could control Terry right. Robisky. Right. And, right. and I sensed that. Right. You know, right. And, and I, when I called you, I think I let you know. That was like 95 or 94, 95. Right. Uh -huh. and, and that happened. I mean, that happened too, because like I said, because. You know, like I said, even when Joe came, like for example, Joe and I sat and interviewed, like I said, for seven hours. I'm sitting with Joe Dean, right? The last thing Joe Dean asked me, he said, Terry, are you serious? He said, what would make you think, what would you, what would make you think a man like you, a man of your color, could come down to, come down to Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and go down on the bayou and get them white kids to come to LSU? What make you think you can do that? I said, Joe, wait, let me think, there's two things there. What made you think you could send a white goat to my house in 1973 and he could get me to come? Did you think that could happen? But it did. I said, but you know the difference between me and that governor? I said, I grew up on the bayou. I know them bayous. I speak them language on the people on the bayou. I said, I could go to, I could go to their house through the back door and I can recruit them and get them to come down the street because I know everybody on the bayou. I said, I was born on the bayou. Everybody know you. Everybody know me. You know? And he says, that's a hell of an answer. That's a hell of an answer. And then when he left, I knew what, you know, I knew what it was, you know. And then I talked to, as usual, I talked to our guy, Virg Asbury, and I talked to College Temple, and they all told me the same thing. You know, Terry, it ain't gonna happen. They ain't ready, it ain't gonna happen. And we get pushed back, we get pushed back, we get pushed back, you know. And I said, hey man, all you can do is keep pushing. I said, just keep, keep in mind, you know, I said, uh, I came there. I came there when a lot of black wouldn't come. 
I said, I got a lot of pushback, but I pushed through. Mm. You know, I said, so you know, the fact that you get pushed back a little bit, don't give up, keep pushing forward. You know, don't worry about it. It goes a lot of those on. And now you want to go. Now you sent me, I don't know if you want to discuss this, but you sent me a letter uh -huh. that, uh, that spoke to your views, your perspective, your feelings, and your, what you walked, what you went through with LSU over those 40, mm -hmm. 70, 40 years mm -hmm. of them not, you, you had opportunity, you could stay in the league so long enough to see so many other coaches get an opportunity to go Absolutely. back. Absolutely. Go back home, coach for their auto model, to, yeah. the, to be a part mm -hmm. of all this. Uh -huh. and, and you helped a lot of them to get mm -hmm. where they were. Where Absolutely. They were. But that opportunity never came to Terry Rubens. What is that feeling like first for you, not having an opportunity? And secondly, the, that letter that you wrote. <laughs> well, I, you know, the, the opportunity that didn't come hurt, you know, and, 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 and uh, you know, it was, uh, it, it was very, very, it, it, it is, I shouldn't say it was, it is. It's very, very hurtful uh, because I do know that, you know, not just Terry Biscuit, you know, and, you know, the, the, the Richard Roman we're talking about just passed, uh, Laura Hinton. Uh, man, I'll tell you what, the, the first, I can't tell you about you guys. You know, I could go back to, you know, Harrison Francis. I could go back to Clint Burrell, my roommate. I know what we gave. I know what we gave to LSU. I know what we went through LSU. You understand what I'm saying? I know the obstacles that them first seven guys, and I'm not talking about, I'm not gonna talk about the Alan Mishers and the Gene Mobley's in the track, and I'm not talking about the Larry Ships and the College Temples. I'm talking about those seven football players that was in that Broussard Hall, you know, and them guys, you know, you know, want to take us in the shower and beat us, and people throwing bottles at us on the sideline in the course of the game, and you know, I, I, I drop a ball and the guy throwing a beer can at me, hitting the top of my helmet. My own home fan people. I know what we went through. You understand what I'm saying? I know what the opposing teams were going through when you come out of that locker room and they prod that tiger and the tiger piss on everybody. I know what LSU was in 1970, you know what I mean? But as a black man, I came. Knowing all them things and looking at them, I came, you know what I mean? I, I, I ignored that and I ignored the fact that this had happened but it happened to people of my complexion. I ignored all of that. I moved forward, you know what I mean? So when it came time to me, and I'm coaching, and I'm winning Super Bowls, and you know I'm sitting here talking to you today. I got nine players. I got nine players I've coached in the Hall of Fame. I've got 11 coaches that I've coached in professional football that I brought to football. I helped give them job. I tutored them. 11 of them has gone on to become a head coach. 11 guys that have worked for me, that worked under me, that I brought from college football, you understand? And move up to pro football. They've gone back to become head coaches in college or in pro football. 11 guys that have worked under me have become head coaches. A lot of them at their alma mater. You see what I'm saying? Listen, let me tell you something. It was a guy named Donald Newman. You remember I keep saying about Dale Brown, basketball, right? It was a guy named Donald Newman who was one of my best friends. I got Don Newman to come to LSU and become a great player. You got me? Don Newman, seven, eight, ten years ago, called me. I got him a job with the Washington Redskins. Not the Washington Redskins, the Washington Wizards, the basketball team. Because when I was with the Washington Redskins, you got me? There's a guy that bought the Washington Wizards basketball team. That guy named Ted Leonsis become a great friend of mine. So when there was a job that was open, Don Newman called me. I called Ted. Ted hired him. And then about a month later, you know what they did? They hired a guy named Collis Temple Jr. Because me. Collis Temple Jr. is an LSU grad, right? And the university hired grad. And he was looking for a job, and Don Newman called me and said, call Ted, man. And I called Ted. Collis Temple Jr. is on the basketball court. He ain't a football player. He's on the basketball court in Washington, D.C. And the owner goes over and says, you know Terry Rubinsky? That's my dude. You know what I'm saying? So I done been full circle, man. Listen, I can tell people, bro, I've gone from London to Hawaii. You can go walk the sand, my prince in it. I've been there. I've been there. You know what I mean? 
But when I came to LSU, I didn't see color. And the great thing about that was I went to class with a bunch of people, like a girl named Pat Dean, her and her husband and her kids. They didn't see my color. They had me come to their house in 1973 and sit at the table with them and have dinner. Neil Brown had me come to his house and have dinner. They didn't see color. And it's just embarrassing that all the years that other shoes called me, they saw color. You know what I mean? They saw color. You know what I mean? And that's what hurt me the most. Because LSU hired a guy named Les Miles, right? And I'm not sure, but I think they just had to, didn't they just get fined and had to vindicate some wins with Les Miles, mm -hmm. right? Les Miles came and did an internship with me. Internship? Internship with under, me. Under your tutorage? At my, under my tutorage. And where, where you were at? The Washington Redskins. Because Les Miles, was a graduate assistant coach at the University of Michigan. And as a graduate assistant, he was working with a guy named Cam Cameron. Cam Cameron was a guy that I helped hire with the Washington Redskins. Cam Cameron came, I was assistant head coach. I didn't have the title, but I was then the offensive coordinator for North Turner. Cam Cameron can't work with me. He asked me, do you mind? Les, Les wants you to teach him some stuff about the passing game. Do you mind Les coming and spend a couple weeks with us? Les Miles can't work for us. He can't work there with me. For free, he was just there getting getting educated. And then two years later, he beat me out of my own job for my own school, for my two own Two years university. later? Two years later, he was a little graduate assistant. Just came work for us for free for a week or two just to get some knowledge about the passing game. I'm sitting there telling him about the passing game. And then he beats me out of this job. But Les Miles beat me out, not because of LSU. Well, I should say because of LSU. He beat me out because of Joe Dean, because Joe Dean was great friends with a guy named Gil Brandt from the Washington Redskins. Gil Brandt, right? You know how Converse Shoes got that star on the side? Mm -hmm. The Dallas Cowboy got a star on the side. Gil Brandt and Joe Dean, they worked together, put together the Converse, started a company called Converse. So Joe Dean called Gil Brandt. Gil Brandt is friends with Les Miles because they're the same complexion. And then Les Miles comes in and get the job. Les Miles had just done an internship with me two years before that. I'm teaching him football. But he became the head coach at LSU. I didn't. You know what I mean? But every time the LSU job had ever come open, as far as I know, it's one or two, maybe three African American. There's three guys in my complexion, two, three guys in my complexion that's on the board of supervisor. One of them called me every year, College Temple. You know, he called me every year like we're the best friends in the world. He tell me how much power he got. He tell me how he runs everything. You know, but he always tell me how when he bring my name up, he get pushed back. But when I talk to one or two other black guys on the board, they say he never brings my name up. So, you know, that's why I said when you ask me why I'm not in the hall, I said, I guess I got to get College Temple a vote. Because I don't know what else to do. I didn't know you was going there with that. I didn't want to go there. But I didn't, you know, I don't, it don't bother me. Yeah, I know it don't bother you. That it don't bother me. You keep it real, my brother. That old it don't bother me. Real. You know what I mean? Listen, I told you just now. I got 47 years in the NFL. I already got my social security. I already got my pension. <laughs> you can check coming everywhere. Huh? It don't matter with me. You know what I mean? What they going to do? I don't think they're going to shoot me. You know, they, they used to do that. They used to kill me. You know, it would waste a good bullet on you. It would waste a bullet. You know, <laughs> that's all. And the biggest problem about it, the one thing they have to understand, 90% of them, they pull, a, they pull out a gun, pull the trigger, shoot. I ain't going to die. They can't kill me. <laughs> oh, man. I ain't going to die. What they going to do? They shoot the bullet ricochet. <laughs> they can't kill me. <laughs> that, that bad boy. They can't kill me. That, that, so, that, that, been there. Now what? Listen, this is one thing you got to understand, right? You remember we said when that draft was going on that first day, the first six, the first six round, that first day, mm -hmm. we said, wow, it was an eye opener for me. It was an eye opener for me because I've been loved everywhere I've been. High school, LSU, man, I love, man. People love me, I love them back. You know what I mean? But I realized the rest of the world didn't know who the hell I was. Didn't care who you were. Didn't care who I was. They don't give a shit about Terry Biscuit. Nobody drafted me. You remember I told you that? You remember? And somebody, let me tell you something. From all them little trails I just told you, you can go to Hawaii and walk that sand, you're going to see my print. You go to London, you're going to see me. You got me? You go to LSU campus, the Lock Cook Center, my name's on that wall. You can go to Las Vegas, the Raiders, got that big old beautiful stadium you just built, my name's on that wall. You got me? You can go to Canton, Ohio, which is where the world go, to see who's been the best, right? My name's on that wall. I tell you what's special about that one. I, I came to LSU. I was the number one recruit in the nation, right? Remember that? At LSU. 
I came in, I set records, I broke records, I left records. A lot of them changed, but a lot of them they can't change. You know which ones they can't change? The ones that said, I'm the first. I'm the first, right? First freshman score. First leading this. First thousand yard rusher. Right? First. Oh, yeah. First thousand yard rusher. You got me? SEC MVP. They can't break that one. LSU MVP. Can't break that one. James Corbett's, right? College player of the year. They can't change that one. They can't break that one. I'm the first. You right? You can break records, but you can't break the first. Right? Stand on the Last year, I'm sitting at home. I retired. Last year, I retired. The league office, NFL office, NFL, right? Greatest league in the world. As high as you can go, right? NFL calls. In 103 years of football, I was there almost 50. <laughs> I was there almost 50 years out of 103 in existence. You got me? In 103 years of football, the NFL had never put an assistant coach in the Hall of Fame. There had never been one. They didn't induct the assistant coaches. They called me. And they said, we changed the rules. This year you retire. We're going to put assistant coaches in the Hall of Fame. You're going to be the first. First again. You can't change that rule. They can't break that. They changed just to just to make sure that Terry Robissi got it. No, Terry Joseph Robissi. I don't know if that's why they did it, but I'm going to take it like that. I'm going to believe that. Okay? Last year was the first. And last year they put five coaches in the Hall of Fame. Assistant coaches. First time in the history of football, assistant coaches were going in. Last year they put five. It was me and Jimmy Ray and you know who Jimmy voted? Ray. Let me tell you this, you know, yeah, you know Jimmy too, right? <laughs> you know who did that? You know who voted on those five things? You know who voted on that? A guy named Tony Dungeon, Bill Cowher, who beat me in that last game ever at Tree River Stadium, Mike Hogan, who beat me a lot of places. I won a lot of games. Jimmy, those are the guys that voted it. And you know what Mike Holcomb said to me? Terry Rubinsky, if you don't go in the Hall of Fame, they should never put coaches in, ever. That's, that's what Mike Holcomb told me. You understand? So that's the first. Ain't nobody, nobody, nobody in the way in the world can take. My name is on that wall. And hopefully I don't, you know, kill somebody and they take it down. <laughs> my name, my name is on that wall. And it's up there as the first. So they can break a lot of records again. Ain't nothing else I can do, bro. You know what I mean? Ain't nothing else I can do. Again, I'm on a I'm on a wall in Natchitoches, Louisiana, the Louisiana Hall of Fame. I'm on a wall in the Superdome, the New Orleans Hall of Fame. I got my Jim Corbett hanging on my wall. You understand? And your university. That's all. That you gave. You gave all I had. Yeah, no, they've been great for me. I've met a million people. I've been, I've loved, uh, I've loved my time there. I've loved walking around and people, you know, I saw Shaq the other day. I saw Shaquille O'Neal the other day. And uh, we boat in Beverly Hills at the Beverly Hills Hotel. And uh, we sitting over there. <laughs> and it was funny, you know, he came in with a lawyer and the guy that runs the hotel said, hey, Biscuit. People who love me call me Biscuit. You know, this guy runs the Beverly Hills Hotel. And I see a bunch of LSU people come through there. And the guy said, hey, Biscuit, uh, you alum, alum over there. And I called Dale Brown, and Dale Brown called him. He said, oh, you Terry Biscuit. You know, so I've got a lot from LSU, man. Uh, it's been a fabulous, it's, you know, it's been a phenomenal ride. It's been great, you know. Uh, if I could go back and change, you know, if I could go back and change, uh, I would I would make us win more games. You know, I would make that, because that's, that's all that's important. That's not weird, man. Yeah, that's all that's important. I would make us win. I would make us win more games and, uh, and, and, and and turn that part around, you know. That would certainly change for me, you know. But I think uh, uh, from from the other side of that, you know, um, you know, it's been fantastic, man. I love it. Listen, you know, again, I'm coaching the pros. I've coached, I've coached some of the best. You call a position, I can tell you, I, I've coached them. You know, from Marcus Allen to Bo Jackson to Eric Dickerson to Tony Gonzalez, uh, you know, Tim Brown, you know, uh, you name them, I've, I've been with them. Archell, Gene Upshaw, I've been with them. I've coached Freddie Butler in the call. If you call them, I know them. Owners, you know, Al Davis, Don Schuler, John Madden. I tend to work with better people. I mean, I've worked with the best that's ever done it. You know what I mean? I've learned from all, from all, you know what I mean? But it hurts that I've never had the opportunity to come back to my university and, and, and teach and bring some of that, you know, and bring some of that. And just give it a chance. See if I could win. You know, it, see if I could win. You know, it, they would have brought you back. Did it actually come as an assistant coach years ago? Would you have come? I said no. They did. 
Mm-hmm. They did. Yeah, they did. Uh, uh, I don't remember who took the job when Coach uh, when Coach Saban. I don't. I don't. I don't think that was Les Miles. Yeah, uh, but they didn't ask me with Les. Carlos Temple asked me to come. It might have been with. It might have been when Coach Saban was here. Uh, Carlos Temple. Carlos Temple's the guy called me all the time. You know what I mean? Um, but but you know again, I think it's fake. You know, I think it, I think it's called fake. You know, but Carlos Temple called me, and uh, you know and. He called me and said, hey, man, I'm going to get you the job. I'm going to get you the job. I'm going to get you the job. And we go with that conversation. And then we start off and say, I'm going to get you the job, man. It's time for you to come back. It's time for us to bring you back. And, and I get all pumped up. You know, oh, yeah, oh, but I'm going home. Oh, man, I'm going to my state school. Oh, man, I'm going back on bed. I get all pumped up, you know. And then about three weeks later, he called back, man, it just ain't going to happen, man. It just they ain't ready for you, man. Oh, man, I just can't get it done. You know, I just, and I'm like, dude, like, I think there's a bridge that goes from Bad Woods to Port Allen. There's a bridge that goes from Bad Woods to Donsonville. Call the temple, you build both of them bridges. You you done build bridges but you can't get me back to L doesn't something here don't make sense. You know, no. you know, here's a guy that took L S U stadium from you know, this guy helped to build a stadium from an eighty thousand stadium to a hundred and twenty thousand seat stadium. The guy got every you know, built every like College Temple done, done everything he has to do in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. You know what I mean? Right. He done helped them to pick the mayor, he done helped them to pick the governor, he done done it all. But God damn, for some reason he can't get Terry Mischke back on that game. <laughs> that just blows my mind. You understand what I'm saying? So, you know, that's the thing that's interesting about it, you know. But, uh, you know, the thing about me is he called me, uh, talked to me. He's going to get me the job. I'm going to get you the job. I'm going to get you the job. And I'm going to get you the head job. I'm going to get you the head job. I'm going to get you the head job. And then come back and say, hey, would you mind coming back being assistant coach? Why? I'm at the greatest level in, in all of football. Half of your assistant coaches want to be pro coaches. Why would I come back there to be a wide receiver coach? You know, oh, oh so if we don't win, if, if we don't win, then, you know, we'll fight that guy and we'll make you the head coach. Well, if you're going to make me the head coach, just make me the head coach. Why I got to come back and lose? That doesn't make no sense to me. You know what I mean? And I'm telling him, well, let's be honest about it. If that's going to be the case, then I'm going to come back there. I'm going to come there and I'm going to coach my receivers to run the wrong route and go the wrong way and drop the ball. So we lose. If you're telling me that we're going to have to lose for me to get the job, right? I'm going to coach my guys to lose. I'm going to coach them to go the wrong way and drop balls and figure I'm going to be the head coach. You know what I mean? No, man, I can't coach like that. I've never coached anything. I've done anything in my life to lose. I, I'm going to win. Whatever I do, I, I go to do it to win. You know what I mean? I said, no, no, I can't, I, can't, I can't do that. I can't, I can't come back as assistant coach. You know? And listen, and I'm not talking about things that happened in 1994 when you and I talked in 1997. And I'm not, I'm not talking about all that back then. I'm talking about two years ago. Still going I'm talking about two years ago when they called me and asked me to come back and listen they called me and asked me to come back and they offered me a contract and they told me how much it's going to pay me you know and all that and I talked to them and talked to Carlos and I got a contract I mean, we, I'm coming it's done but I realized I hadn't talked to Ed Ojoa the head coach and then I realized that the football coach I got to call that man and I got to talk to that man and I got to tell him you know hey man these guys calling me and they offered me a contract and tell me how much they're going to pay me and I'm coming are you okay with that? And Ed said no. He Ed said, said no. He, wasn't, he wasn't okay with it. He said he wasn't okay with it. And and, and then, you know, I would find out college would tell me, you know, uh Ed said no because Verge Verge thought I was coming back to take his job. Verge Esper thought I was coming back to take his job. And Verge called me. You know, and I know you didn't think I'm gonna go there, but I go there, I don't care, you know. And Verge called me and said, you know, what you come and do? And I told him he thought I was coming to take his job. So he went and told Ed that you know if you bring Terry back in now if you fail and lose the first three, four games, they're going to fire you and give it to Terry. And, and, and Verge went and convinced him that. And then when, when Verge walked out, he called the president and said, y'all bring Terry here, give him my money, I'm leaving. Give him the money, y'all owe me, I quit. And I told him, no, that's okay. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not coming to stuff and shit like that. I'm coming to help the school. I ain't coming to hurt nobody. And if I'm going to cause that kind of distraction, I ain't there yet, I ain't coming. Don't worry about it, I'm cool. Because everybody, you know, everybody coming, you, don't, you you got to watch your back when you get here. No question. You, know you, I mean? you don't know what's going on. I don't know what the hell's going on, you know what I mean? But I'll tell you what was interesting for me. Verge called me and asked me that I think it was right. And that hurt my heart now. Because he asked me, hey, hey, Terry, do you think it's right that you're coming back here after being gone for 50 years? you coming back here and they're going to pay you more than they're paying me? I've been here 24 years, man. You think that's right? Do you think it's right for them to bring you back and pay you more than they're paying me? I said, great, I don't look at it that way. If they're paying me more than they're going to pay you, I think you ought to go in there and ask for a raise. <laughs> I said, well, let me ask you this question. Do you think it's right for you to have been there working for 24 years and making the money you've made? When I've got to ask you, 
where were you in 1973 when the people were sending me the hate letters for coming there? When I opened that door for you to go there. So you think it's right for you to be there 24 years and made that money you made because I opened the door? Is that right? And now you tell me I can't come because you think I'm going to make more money than you? And I'm trying to take your job? I don't want your job. I want to help win. I'm about winning, bro. So it, it, it's... it's uh, right. Ooh, so that's how that letter came about? That's how that letter came about. That's how I wrote the letter and uh, sent the letter to people I know and sent it to the board of supervisors. How would you tie that letter? The, the letter to LSU? Yeah. Because this thing got to be so chaotic. And no, and no question. So you had to bring some clarity. I had to express myself. Yeah. I had to express myself. Because let people know that I didn't orchestrate this. I didn't. I'm just in the background. That's all. And I, uh -huh. I don't know what's all... Just that uh -huh. you had enough way with all of them. I didn't talk to Coach, to Coach O because right. I'm talking to everybody except him. Absolutely. He's supposed to, I'm supposed to be working it for him. That's right. He's the head coach. But I wasn't coming in originally, so I wasn't coming in to coach. I was coming in to work off in the background and be a, kind of an assistant and helping out over here. See, and that's why Verge got nervous. I was coming to do his job. So Verge called me actually. You, 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 you're not even interested in that job. I'm not interested in that. You know what I mean? But I ain't interested in the head job either. I'm interested in coming back to my school to help win. So I can be part of a winning program. Mm -hmm. That's all I do. You know what I mean? And anybody that I've worked with all my life in the, in the NFL would tell you, Terry ain't interested in taking no head coaching job or taking nobody's job. I don't play them games. I'm interested in winning. Because I know when we win, we all win. You know what I mean? When we lose, we all get fired. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I don't be sitting out there trying to take no head coach's job. Ain't no head coach, no way ever. That's why five or six jobs I've been on, I've been assistant head coach. You see what I'm saying? I ain't trying to take nobody's job. I'm trying to get us all on the same page. So we all can win, you know what I mean? I'm not coming here trying to take O's job, and I'm not coming here with the anticipation that if he lose the first four or five games, they're gonna give me the job. You know, that ain't me. I don't operate that way, you know what I mean? I'm coming here to say, hey, oh, you can't do this. I wouldn't do that, you know, we're gonna lose. You know, hey, oh, you got a problem with that guy, let me talk to that guy. Hey, hey, you got a problem with this guy, let me handle this guy. I got him, don't worry about it, let me handle him. You got a guy named Sugar Bowl, that guy, you know, you try to figure out how he fit in, let me have him, let me go have lunch with him, let me fix that for you. That's what I'm coming to do, you know what I mean? And But somehow, uh, Verge took it that I was coming to do his role and take and, his job. And, but, but I can understand, I can understand where Verge is coming from now. Mm -hmm. You know, as mm -hmm. you explain this to me, mm -hmm. cause Verge is a dog too. Mm -hmm. He don't, he's not a part of what's going on. He hear about what's going on. Mm -hmm. So his job, is his purpose, now I gotta protect my job. Mm -hmm. So I gotta go talk to Coach Joe, let Coach Joe know what they get ready to do to him. Right, right, <laughs> so, right. And I, like I said, I didn't understand, I don't understand it, cause again, you know, and nobody called me and said, Terry, you come on in and uh, we're going to have you do Ver Verge Asbury's job. You know what I mean? I, didn't, I ain't never saw him coming in and do Verge's job. I'm coming here to stand up in my office and look out that window and say, this football team needs to do this. That football player right there needs to do this. That football player what, right there. What, needs to what was that job title? Was? I don't know. Nobody ever said what the title was going to be. You know, nobody ever said what the title was going to be. But I, was, uh, but I wasn't going to be coaching. We, we, we did say that. I wasn't going to be coaching. I wasn't going to be on the field. I wasn't going to be coaching. And I guess, like I said, I guess that's where the nervousness for Verge came in. You know what I mean? So if everybody would have been at the table, they would have understood what was going on. I would and assume that. And there would have been an yeah. opportunity to really right. put some things in place. Right. Yeah. Now, what you thought about the, uh, the hire of Brian Kelly? Uh, I don't know Brian. I mean, I don't know him. Uh, I don't think I've ever met him. Um, you know, I know a lot of people talk about him at, uh, a lot of people talk about him at Notre Dame, you know, and, and, and what a great job he did, and a great job he did for them. Um, I don't know coach, I've just, you know, I've just been obviously in my profession and coaching in my profession. Um, I was shocked that he would he would leave Notre Dame, that shocked me. With, with $10 million then? Well, that's what the thing was, you know, when he found out how much he was making. And, you know, I thought that was interesting. Um, as I told College Temple, you know, when you guys sit down and say you're going to pay a guy uh, 10 years, $100 million, I think you could have got Bill Belichick. <laughs> you know, I, mean, I didn't think you had to go get Brian. I think you could have got Bill Belichick. For, for $10 million? Then, uh, there's no question in my mind. You could have got Bill Belichick. I'll, listen, I'll bet you my mama house and they go to Louisiana. <laughs> they could have got, they could, if they if they wanted Bill Belichick, they could have got him. But if they called Bill and said no, I'll bet you everything and they go to Louisiana. I'll bet you all they go to Louisiana, they could have got Sean Payton. For $100 million? 10 years? 10 years, $100 million? I'll bet you everything in that guard Louisiana, they could have got Sean Payton. <laughs> Sean Payton would have been right there. I'll bet you that. And let me tell you something else. 
if they had called Sean, if they called Sean Payton and said, we're going to give you 10 years, $100 million, but Interstate 10 is closed, you can't get here, Sean would have started walking down the Mississippi River. Sean would have started walking down the Mississippi River. I've known Sean for a long time. You follow me. I know Sean, and I, listen, let me tell you something. I know Sean Payton, and we're good friends, and Sean tried to hire me two, three times. And we're great friends, and we've coached together against uh, against each other a lot. We got great love and great respect for each other. If they had told him that we'll give him a hundred million dollars for ten years, if they told him ten was closed, I bet you he'd be walking out of levy. You go walk out of levy today, Sean be walking out of levy with hat on. I bet you that. You know what I mean? Yeah, that, that's a that, that was a game changer. Ain't no serious. question. Ain't no question. Ten, you know not five years. No, ten, ten years. years. Ten million dollars a year. And we talking about a guy that's won and won okay and did okay and had a they like to say had a clean program and all. Did he win the national championship? How many times he won that? Can, can he win the SEC? Let me ask you this question. That's what that's the first question I asked Carlos Temple. Can he get on the boat and go in the back door with the houses on the bayou to go recruit them same white kids to come to LSU? Can he get them kids off the bayou? Because that's the question Joe Dean asked me. <laughs> Bring it back. Can he get them kids off the bayou to come to LSU? That's what that's what I want to know. You know what I mean? So, you know, again, it's my alma mater. I bet on them. I bet money on them, and I win some bets. I'm always betting Julio, and uh, uh, I'm always betting all my guys, all my guys that coach. Alabama boys, all of us, always. I'm always with Alabama, Nat Moore's at Florida. Uh, I got them all. Champion Teddy again. If we go play Ohio State, I got. I'm always betting. On, I always bet. Always bet LSU. I always call. A lot of them I got a standing bet. You know, I call them, listen, I call I call Nat Moore last week. Right? We just won a national championship bet. We. You hear what I said, right? We <laughs> we just won a national championship in baseball. Right. I called Nat Moore. I said, Hey man, talk to me. I said, Didn't we uh didn't we have ten thousand right on that game? <laughs> he said, Yeah. He said, Yeah, he said, Didn't you spot the twenty five points? <laughs> So, you know, guys that I've been with forever and ever and ever, you know, you know, AJ Dewey. You know, AJ Dewey is the biggest LSU human being in the world. Yeah. And, uh, oh my God, man. AJ, AJ, Dewey, man. AJ is like you. I haven't seen him in, in that room. Nobody, nobody sees AJ, man. But AJ is the realest dude in the world. He's the greatest. I'm going to say it. Maybe other than Dale Brown, he's the greatest thing happened to me at LSU. No. Everybody said, oh, wow, that's a white guy. You know, the AJ Dewey took me in as a roommate when nobody else would. When we got to LSU campus, and they said, God, oh, Terry need a room at AJ Dewey. Walked in the head coach's office and said, he gonna room with me. He gonna room with me. And AJ took me and accepted me to come in his room in a room with him. And that man loved me to death. I got cut by the Raiders. And fortunately, I had played for Don Shula in the senior bowl. And Don Shula, Don Shula loved me in the senior bowl, but he didn't draft me. But I had played for him. So when the Raiders cut me, Shula brought me to Miami. AJ Dewey picked me up at the airport. AJ Dewey took me over there, got my locker, set me up, took me to his house. And he says, hey man, you got a car? No, take this one. Give me his green Bronco truck. You don't need to rent a car. Me and my wife got two, three cars. You take this car. Give me his truck. He said, man, if you need somewhere to stay, you can have that back bedroom. You can stay with me and my wife. I said, I can't do that, man. You got you, your wife, and your kids, man. It's your family. I can't do that. You know what I mean? I know this. You know, if he came down to me, uh, right off the bat, LSU came here. I wouldn't have said, yeah, let me have AJ come over with me. You know what I mean? That dude took me in and loved me to death like a brother, man. And AJ, I said today, is the greatest LSU flag carrier in the world. Ain't nobody can ever tell AJ anything bad about LSU. You know what I mean? So that's just so, man. Like, I got great, great ties, a lot of great friends. I still talk to Laura Hinton. Anywhere I go, anywhere I've ever, anywhere I've ever played in pros, Laura Hinton always come to my games. Mm -hmm. Always, always find two, three games. He always showed up. He always came, you know. But let me tell you something again, Lana. I'm walking the streets. I'm walking the streets one time in Paris, France. And a guy walked up and he said, you Terry Bishop? I said, yeah, I am. He said, why don't you ever come back to LSU and help us? You were the greatest player, one of the greatest players in LSU history. I said, you need to go buy the team. <laughs> and, <they> come. <laughs> and, come. and I'm, I'm in Paris, France, man. I'm walking the beach of Hawaii. And the guy was over there in the Omi or some shit in the Omi gear on, man. And the guy come to me and he said, man, he said, I love you when you was LSU. You're a great man. I'm glad you opened that door. Because, again, without you guys, we wouldn't have survived. He said, Terry, you mean the world for me. I'm in New York City. I'm in New York City. And I go to a restaurant and a kid walks in there. 
that kid's daddy. It used to be a store in College Square. Rubenstein? Was it Rubenstein? Rubenstein. Uh, 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 suit, so suits. Suits and something? Yeah. Rubenstein. Okay, so that guy, grandfather, had started Rubenstein. And he started working at that store on College Drive when I was playing football. And that kid came to me at a restaurant in New York City and introduced himself. And he said, man, my daddy sure loves some Terry Biscuit. I said, New York City. I'm from that little bitty town, bro, that still today might have a couple of dirt roads. We ain't got no sidewalk. We don't believe in sidewalk. <laughs> and, but I'm in New York City in a restaurant, and the kid come over and hug me because of my time at LSU. I'm down on the bayou, in a place called Bayou Gosh, Louisiana. That's almost down a cutoff. That's almost the end of the world. The highway that you drive goes down to the Gulf of Mexico, goes into the Gulf. The, the highway you drive in your car, if you don't stop, it goes into the Gulf. And cut off Louisiana. That's why you cut off. Huh? Cut off. <laughs> I'm down there, and the guy comes over, and he says, "Terry, what are you doing down here? Terry Biscuit." And we start talking. He starts telling me how his daddy used to bring him to my game. His daddy loved Terry Biscuit. His daddy had a Terry Biscuit jersey. I gave his daddy. I threw it to his daddy a Terry jersey. I gave it to his, his daddy my sophomore year of college. That kid lived down there. He says, "You want some turtle? I know what you're looking for. You like turtle? Yeah, I need some turtle. You got some." I got him, you want me to clean him for you? <laughs> That's I, said, all. I said, no, I'm going to clean him. Don't worry about it. <laughs> you make a turtle soup? I make turtle soup with him. <laughs> I don't care. So I guess what I'm saying to you is my time at LSU has been the most incredible time, one of the most incredible time of my life. I've been around the world. A lot of people don't know me for the NFL stuff, but a lot of people around the world know me for my LSU stuff. You know what I mean? So I guess at the end of the day, the only thing I said now that I'm retired, I didn't necessarily need LSU to make me a head coach for the world to know who Terry Bishop really is. I am who I am. God made me. I don't need other shoes to do it. But I wouldn't mind being in the Hall of Fame. <laughs> I heard that. I heard that. That, that, is, that's, that really I heard is mind-boggling to think that, that the number one player, and A.J. Dew is in the LSU Hall of Fame. And y'all yeah. teammates. Ain't no question. So two of the top no LSU players. Ain't offense no question. and defense. Ain't no question. And they did it at least 20 but, years. But again, even though AJ and I graduated at the same time. Uh, yeah, they went to draft together. Went to draft together. Yeah. Yeah. He, he went first and round. He went first round, and I went eight round. But I think when we left LSU, I won the James Carver to work. <laughs> I, I was the SEC MVP. I was the LSU MVP. AJ was. Not, not, not personally, AJ, you just, just speak your facts. Huh? Speak your facts. Yeah, yeah. I'll tell the world, AJ, I think AJ is a better man than me. But he wasn't a better player. <laughs> Not at that time. Not at that time. Hey, you heard from the one and all at that time. Hey, Jay, you heard from, from T himself. Not, Not at that time. But look, look, let's kind of go back to this uh, because of our, our, the loss of our pot. Mm -hmm. Richard Roman. Yeah, matter of fact, that you came home when, after the holiday, after the first year of the NFL. Mm -hmm. Rich, as usual, Richard would throw a party over there off of mm -hmm. uh, what street that was? North Street? Uh, I don't know what street that place is. Uh, convention Street? Convention yeah, Street. Yeah, party all the time. Yeah, that little house on that, on that hill right yeah. there. It, it yeah. was a big party. Yeah. And the great Terry Robiscuit walked in that party. Mm -hmm. You remember he just got yeah. the towel? Yeah. And all the girls were yeah. flocking to Terry. I, I was a freshman then, you know. Mm -hmm. All the girls were flocking to Terry. Mm -hmm. And that was the most impressive thing. Because at the time, you know, I called you, I said, that brother cold. Mm -hmm. Cause you were pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, that was it. A, B, C, D. That's yes. how you roll. That's I mean, right. just straight to the point, straight conversation. Uh -huh. And when I saw something, and I heard a few things about you. The only other brother I saw like that was Lou Sibley. Mm -hmm. You know, that right. spoke truth to power. Right. That's my dude. It, you know, That's and, my dude. And what was interesting to me when I learned that about you and I started hearing you speak, I'm like, where did his brother get this from? He come out the country, come off the plantation. I ain't hear that yasa, yasa, no son, yasa. Mm -hmm. That ain't who you are. So how, how you not, not develop that type of, I mean, the, most of us had that, you mm -hmm. know, like, you know, mm -hmm. I guess you say being around uh, the governor mm -hmm. and people like that, or, that mm -hmm. or you had that before. You had to have that before. Right? Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, like I said, is uh, uh, Governor Edwards, you know, I mean, I spent, you know, I, don't, I spent thousands of hours with that guy. I mean, I'm, I'm, it's just, it's phenomenal the times I spent with him and the time he and I spent together and the travels. And Governor Edwards and I hung out together from my house in Edgar, Louisiana, my driveway, 
from Eggo, Louisiana to Thibodeau, Louisiana, to the Pelche family, right? One of the wealthiest families in all of Louisiana. Mm -hmm. The Pelche family built, Thib built Nichols. They built Thibodeau. They built Nichols. And I'm sitting with Mr. Pelche, and I call him Mr. and the governor. And we go from there, and I'm sitting with the governor in Lake Tahoe, Nevada, at a casino. <laughs> governor. <laughs> same governor. So you touch out the gamble, that's why he's still gambling there. Same, same, <laughs> the same governor. You know what I mean? So you got good things and bad behavior. But the thing, about, the thing about that is, there was never once I ever said Mr. Edwards. Is he good? I said good. Yeah. Governor Edwards. Good. Hey, bro. I mean, that's how we talk. I mean, never once. But, but let me tell you something else. Let me tell you something else. My mom, my dad, my grandfather taught me how to be respectful and how to be respectful to my elders. They taught me that. You got yes, me? Yes, community. They taught me that. So I knew that. I wasn't, I wasn't crazy. I know how to be respectful. I know how to be respectful to my elders. But where my life changed was a guy named L. Davis. A guy named L. Davis. That guy taught me how to be a man. Ooh. And he taught me how to be a man in that world sports football. Al Davis would, would draft me and sit down and say, I got you. Al Davis, listen, not only Al Davis drafted me and had me, Al Davis had a guy he had drafted named Cliff Brand, was his son. But Al Davis had adopted me. When that man took me in his office, that man adopted me. And I sit down at night and talk to him and he's training me how to be a man. And one thing he told me, he says, hey, keep in mind, don't ever call me mister. But Al Davis didn't just tell it to me, Al Davis told it to everybody. All of his players, he never wanted you to call him mister because he always wanted you to know you ain't working for him, you're working with him. You, you ain't working for me, you're working with me. We doing this thing together, Terry. We trying to win this Super Bowl together. Screw them other people out there. And he always told me, Terry, if a man don't stand up and look you in the eyes, look him in his eyes and tell him if I can. I said, because at the end of the day, you a man like he's a man. And he ain't nothing about him to ever make him better than you. You gonna always be your best and you gonna be the best. He says so. Don't ever, ever, he ever. He'll speak that into you. To me. On a regular. On a regular. And when I left the Raiders, I can't tell you times that I'd ever sit down and say, Mr. Davis. If I talk about it, I'd say, Mr. I never ever had to say Mr. to him. Nobody did. He wanted us to call him out. I called him coach. So when I left him, the first time I left the Raiders, I've been there 15 years. 15. 15 years I've been there coaching and playing. And when I left, I went to Washington, D.C. And I went to work in Washington, D.C. for a guy named Mr. Cook. Jack and Cook. And Jack and Cook at the time, back then now, considered one of the most racist owners in the history today in the history of professional football. <laughs> and I never forget it all my life. He called me in his office and he said, hey, we have a mutual friend. And I had a mutual friend, guy that I had met in Los Angeles. I'd met him in LA with Lyde Cook, right? It wasn't Bob Dole, it was another one. And the guy called him and he told him, he said, hey man, it's a hell of a coach you got. He said, but let me tell you something else. He's a better man than he is a coach. And that's what that guy told Cook. So when I went to Washington DC, Cook called me Tell the secretary, go get that guy on meeting. And I went in there and I met him and he shook hands with me and I shook hands with him and we talked across the table from each other. But I walk in like I walk in. I got my own persona. I walk in, I'm a man, you a man. You know what I mean? And I tell him all in a heartbeat, when God calls, we all gonna leave. <laughs> you ain't that much man, you know? So I sat down with him, never forget him as long as I'm living. I sat down there with him, we met, we talked, I met, talked, we met, I talked, I talked to that man for about an hour. He said, you got anything for me, Terry? I said, yeah, I got one question. I said, all my days I worked for Al Davis for 15 years. He called me out. I called him out. I said, all the days I worked for Al, Al Davis, I called him out. I said, how do you want me to address you when I see you? <gasps> oh, absolutely not. You will always address me, Mr. Nobody ever called me out of my name. My name is Mr. Jack Kenny Cook. And don't you ever forget that. And he told me something else. I can't repeat that on the line over here. I said, okay. Thanks a lot, Mr. Cook. I got it and left it the last time I ever spoke to him. <laughs> Never spoke to him again in my life. 
You know you couldn't work for him, man. I worked for him. I stayed there. I worked for seven years. Oh, but you never saw him again. I saw him. But, but you, you I never spoke to him. You just never make sure you didn't speak to him. But you were going to say Mr. Toy. I ain't going to say Mr. Toy. Uh, I ain't going to make sure Mr. Toy. Because now you're giving me the impression so, that you up here and I'm down here and I'm working for you. So I, you I, worked I, for the man, but you I were going for seven years. And you've been, he was in his presence. In his presence. See him, come to meet, walk in meetings with him, never speak to him. Never spoke, I never spoke to him again. Never spoke to him again. I'm on the, I'm on the elevator, he get on the elevator. I'm on the elevator going, I just changed my clothes, put my coaching gear on, I'm on the elevator, he comes, comes in to work, he gets on the elevator, I'm on the elevator, he gets on the elevator, I'll stay on the elevator, look upstairs. Never spoke to him again. Never said good morning to him. And I was in his organization. Now he died, but I was in his organization seven years. Never spoke to him again. He ever he never came to address that issue? Okay. He knew what was going he knew it. Was. I don't care what he knew. <laughs> he told me I had to call it I had to call it Mr. I didn't know. I ain't got to know uncertainty. I missed it. I, I, I ain't got I ain't got to do that. You know? But let me tell you something, just like I told you a minute ago. As I as I have gone through my time, I'm at LSU. Right? I'm in LSU, like you said, like we said, I'm the man, right? A guy named Al a guy named Al Green come in to play a concert. Right? A guy named Jerry Walker, PR director, get hooked up with Al Green, say, You gotta meet Terry Bitsky, the man. I go to dinner with Al Green, you gotta meet you, right? I go to dinner with Al Green. Right? They're love and happiness. Next week if I go to Memphis, Tennessee, I call Al Green. When I meet people and I fall in love with you, I'm in love with you. This is for life, bro. Next week, Al Green guy called me and said, hey, man, we coming out to L.A. in a month. I'll see if you're going to be around. Come on. I'm sitting out here. i I never forget it, bro. I'm at the Assembly Center. The O.J.'s are playing. I go to O.J.'s. I got my, my girl with me. My girl's in my home. That's my one girl, man. Well, that's the one college temple married. That's why you won't vote for me. <laughs> that's, my, that's my girl. Oh, you going to go there, bro? I forgot that. I forgot that. You know what I mean? <laughs> Yeah, no, I won't say nothing nice. about that then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So he ended, up, he ended up taking out of my car and married her. God bless him. But me and her walk in the concert, and a policeman comes over. And I, I stop and I'm trying to, you know, look around where I'm going on. And he come and push on me and, hey, 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 Terry. You know, hey, you, get out of the way. And I turn to like, you know who I am? What are you talking about? <laughs> and then all of a sudden, man, the cat throw me out the, throw me out the zipper and said, man, I'm mad as hell, man. So I got kicked out of the Simpson. I got to call the governor and get me back in here, man. So call the governor. He called the chief of police. I get in, blah, 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 blah. I go in there and, you know, I meet Gerald Verd. I go to Cleveland Mar. I call Gerald Verd. I met that dude in 1975, I believe, man. You know what I mean? When I meet people, man, it's just me and I'm just, I am who I am. I'm with you forever. You know, it just, it's just the way I, I love people, man. I love, I love people. I love me. I told you, man, listen. The day, the day that, uh, the day that the president, Bill Clinton, was let go, said, no, nope, nothing wrong, he's good, he's clean, we ain't gonna prosecute him. I was sitting in the office with a guy named Jesse Jackson. It was me, Jesse Jackson, and a guy named John Thompson, the old basketball coach from Johnson. We sitting in there having lunch, I have lunch with everybody, bro. We sitting in there with Jesse Jackson, the phone ring. Jesse told the secretary, Felicia, I told you, don't you know, call me. I'm busy. You know, I'm in the meeting with the coach. She said, no, you might want to take this. He put it on speaker going, yeah. It's Bill Clinton. Oh, what's up, President? How you doing? <laughs> we sitting there, the three of us sitting there. And he says, ah, blah, 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 blah. Man, they found me not guilty. They let me go. They ain't going to prosecute me. I'm good to go. And he said, oh, that's a good idea, man. Okay, that's great. I'm happy for you, Mr. President. But keep your penis in your pants now, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sitting there with him laughing, man. He told it to the President of the United States. And I'm sitting there with him laughing. Man. Like, these dudes are talking. This is real, man. You know, this is crazy. Now, why am I sitting there with Jesse Jackson, right? Jesse Jackson sees that, that he feels there's racism in the NFL. He heard me speak about that racism, and he heard me come up and speak that this ain't real, man. This this is this is wrong. You don't treat people this way, you know, because you know this is whatever. This is 1987 or what it was. But I'm sitting there saying, at that time, that, that whatever year it was, but the Packers had just won the Super Bowl, and a guy named Sharon Lewis, who I just inducted yesterday in the Hall of Fame, Thursday in the Hall of Fame, mm -hmm. right? As a coach now, I'm on the board now, so I put him in. Sean Lewis is off in the corner for the Green Bay Packers. They won the Super Bowl. Nobody interviewed him as a head job. And I come out and say, that's, that's crazy, man. How can that guy 
do what he's been doing for the last eight, nine, ten years, and nobody interviewed him for a job. That's crazy. That's unbelievable. Jesse Jackson called me. And he called me through John Thompson because he knew I knew John. So he called me. John said, come on, Terry, let's go meet with him. We'll go over there and meet with him. And he said, hey, man, Terry, you shouldn't be speaking like that. People won't get you. Let me speak for y'all. Let me do that. Let me speak for y'all. You know? And I said, what made me bulletproof, but I ain't. <laughs> God made both of us. Right? So I said, I ain't worried about that, man. I said, but I'm cool. If you want to come speak, you can come. But then I took it back to the all the black coaches, and they, a couple of them voted no. They didn't want them to represent them because they were scared it was going to create too much animosity. You know, for them. So they said no. You know? And I told Jesse, I said, well, coach, I said, Jesse, you know, uh, let me find out from the guys if they want to. And when I told him they said no, he said, what? And John Thompson said, Jesse, I told you now, there ain't every black person like your ass. I told you. I'll never, I don't talk to these guys, man. You know? But I guess what I'm saying to you is, these are circles I've traveled. You know, I told you I said with, I said with Lod Cook, man. Lod Cook was more powerful than the President of the United States. Back then, Lod Cook was more powerful than the President yeah, of the United States. Yeah, because he brought three presidents to LSU, three or four presidents. Lod Cook thing. was more powerful than the President of the United yeah. States when I'm sitting out having lunch with this dude, man. I'm sitting out having lunch with him, and I give him a Raider jersey with his name on the back. You follow what I'm saying? And he's like, Terry, whatever you need, let me know. And I ain't never once thought to say, well, I need to be the head coach of LSU. That ain't never came up. All I said to him was, all I need is you and your friendship. That's all I need. Because I tell people all the time, I mean, and I stole that saying. I stole it from you. Yeah. Marino said, We've done so much for so long with so little. We can do anything if you don't give us nothing. That's been in my heart since the day I heard it from that man. I take it everywhere I go. You know what I'm saying? It, they ain't got to give me nothing. Because you come from nothing. I come from nothing, bro. Look how we rise. I come from nothing, man. You let, know what I'm let me tell you, I'm going to share this with you because I got to make sure I correct something with you. Now, you mm -hmm. say you spend more time with that one. I think I spend more time with that one than you did. We was in prison together. So I saw him every day. I fed him. I fed some chicken every day. You probably got the beat. You probably got the beat. We got a chance to spend a lot of time together. He was a good man. He was trying to get to know. But that's a. I better not go there because I, I'm going to leave some things on the table. Right? Okay. I'm going to leave some things on the table. Don't be afraid to go there. No, no, no. I'm, I'm going to leave that. Just something I'm just okay. uh, But I want to make, make a comment for something. I don't want it coming from me. Okay. I got you. <laughs> if you were to say it again, I'll continue the conversation. But anyway. About calling his ex wife? No, <laughs> what, what comments you don't want to make? What, what you mean, Carlos ex wife? My, 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 my ex girlfriend, who I'm great friends with him, I'm great friends with her. We all are great friends. I, I I hope I'm friends with his son. I know his son. And we we all are great friends. So so, how, so, so Kyle's a bad boy. He took you. He took her from you. Yeah. Well, you can, yeah. You can say that. he asked me permit. He asked me if she was my girl, and I said no. I said uh, you know we've been we dated and we were friends, and he said would you mind if I date her? And I said I can't tell you that. I want that girl. You got to ask that girl. You know. And uh, he said oh okay. Well, can you ask her? And I said hey Kyle, I want to know if you want to date him. And, would you go on a date with him? And she said, yeah, if you don't mind, I don't mind. Sure, do what you want. And then they went out, and from that day, they got married and had three lovely boys and had, has had a great family and stuff. It didn't work out, but, you know, from there, that's, that's, that's kind of where it went, you know. But, I, you know, listen, I've never held a grudge against Collis. Uh, I've always respected the hell out of him. Um, him and Larry Ship was two of the guys I respected more than anybody because they were some early ones, you know. But but it was all on him, Larry Ship, Gene Mobley, you know, uh, a guy named Alan Misha, you know. Those guys were not Terry Biscuit, you know, College Temple. And, and, and if I've always wondered, you know, if maybe College had a little animosity to me because, you know, he, he was here before me, you know, and, and, and he was the man till I got here. <laughs> you know, really. But, but uh, you know, no, I never had any animosity to want him because of that, you know. And like I said, him and that young lady got together, him and Sonny got together and had a, you know, I think they had a tremendous life the time they was together. Uh, I, I tell you this, he made, uh, I can't tell you if she made him a 
But she didn't make him a better man, I know that. All right? She didn't make him a better man, but I know he made her a better woman. You know, he, made, he made her he made, he made her a better woman. Now let's talk about you, uh, your lovely wife, and your, your, your boys, and mm-hmm. your children you have. I got three boys. I got three, uh, three, uh, three boys, three young men, uh, wonderful guys. Uh, and I married a young lady. I met, I met a young lady out in uh, San Francisco uh, that we got to be friends. Uh, my uncle was dating her aunt. And uh, by, by our families get together for Thanksgiving and things of that nature, her uh, aunt introduced me to her. She's four years younger than me. We became best friends when I had my first knee surgery. Uh, I woke up in the recovery room and she was standing there looking at me. Like, what are you doing here? You know, well, your mama, your mama caught that gray on the bus again. So I'm going to need three days to get here. Somebody got to look out for you for three days. So she came to look out for me uh, for the three days it took my mom to get here. She came to look out for me. And uh, from that, uh, we became we became the best of friends. Um, you know, I tell people all the time, uh, she didn't love me when I married her, and I didn't love her. But we got married because we were best friends. Um, you know, we got to be from her coming out that day and taking care of me in the hospital, like a friend, you know. Uh, we just got to be friends. We grew on each other, man. She was dating another guy. She was dating a guy named Nathan. And um, dating that young man, i never forget they'd be going out and going somewhere. And I said, you can't wear that. That's ugly. That's, that's terrible. That, you know, you need that. And I'd go shopping for her. And I always learned how to shop for ladies because my mom and I had my mom and my three sisters and two, three sisters. And I would shop for them. And I'd send clothes to my mom all the time. I always told people, you know, but somewhere in my life I might have been a cross-dresser. You know, because, you know, I buy more, I can buy more stuff for ladies and I knew what to pick and all that stuff, you know. So I would go shop for her, you know, I would go shop for her and uh, I'd buy things for her and she'd go out with the guys and she was like, wow, I was going to hit the party last night. Oh, I got, people love what I wore to the wedding, you know. I said, yeah, I loved it too, you know. So from that, you know, she and I would just, you know, just grow. And then uh, we sit down one evening talking and, She's talking about, you know, what she want to do, and she want to be a model, and she want to do this, she want to do that. And, and I said, uh, you know, what's your goal? But I want to get married and have a, I want a white, I want a big white house on the top of the hill with a white picket fence. You know, and uh, that's what I'd like to do, get married and get that, you know. And I said, well, what if, uh, do you feel you can marry your friend? And she's like, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I said, well, look, you know, if you think you can marry your friend, I said, okay, let's get married. I said, you want to get married? And she looked at me, you're crazy. You know, you're crazy. Me, I, I thought I was saying, you're yeah. crazy. She said, you're crazy. She said, we're not even dating. We, we're not even dating. <laughs> not even dating. I said, yeah, but we spend time together all the time. We know each other. We know our, each other's ends and ours. Not. So she said, no, nah, no, nah, 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 no, no, no. And she went home. And she said, breakfast dinner with her mom and her dad. And she asked her mom and dad. She, you know, Cindy's probably 24, 25 years old. And she says, uh, I think Terry proposed to me last night. And her dad and her mama started laughing. And the mom was like, you know, he can't propose. Y'all wasn't barfing a girlfriend. Y'all ain't even dating. She said, yeah. But he said, if, if I don't mind marrying my friend, he'd marry me. And the mama says, girl, I wouldn't touch that man with a 10-foot pole. He's, he's like a sailor. He got a girl in every port. Are you crazy? Yeah. And then she looked at her dad. He didn't say nothing. Then she looked at her dad. She said, what do you think, dad? What do you think? He said, well, uh, if I was you, I'd marry him before sunset tonight. No, I'd give him another day. I'd marry him before sunrise tomorrow. And she said, why? You know, why? And she said, because I know one thing for sure. He spent the rest of his life trying to make you happy. And any day he saw you that you were sad, he'd bring sunshine to your life. And he'll do it for a long time. And, you know, a month ago, uh, we celebrated our 43rd year together. So, yeah, it's worked yeah, so, out. So, so as long as you was in coaching, you've been married. I've been married. Yeah, I've been married. I married her. Uh, I well, what was her name? Cynthia. Cynthia, yeah, you know, Cynthia yeah, she's Cynthia. from uh, she's from San Francisco, you know. But her people, her her, her people's background traces to uh, a little small country town in Alabama. Her mom, her daddy, her grandparents. It's a little place called uh, Utah. It's E, I think it's E U T A W, Utah, Alabama. Uh, and same thing, you know. It's uh, I always told her the thing that attracted me to her was that she can go out in the backyard, grab a chicken, wring his neck, and. <laughs> throw him in the skillet and cook him up. Uh, throw, us, yeah. throw him in the skillet and cook him up. You know, so uh, yeah, you know, we we uh, we we fought it. We, we you know we continue to fight it. We continue to grow. Uh, but it's you know it's been fantastic. And like I said, I think the greatest thing that ever happened was I married I married my best friend. You know, and I'm I, I just feel like I'm I think I'm more fortunate than, than a lot of people. You know, because 
you know, I said, I've had two great, unbelievable, great friends. And, uh, you know, got married, you know, married, married that, you know, and I, I married my best friend and college married my best friend. <laughs> so, you know, it's been fantastic. So, yeah. right, that's cool. Oh, that's good. Now you also had you had one or two sons that played in that band. Yeah, yeah. My oldest son came out. Uh, he came out. He was uh, when he came out of high school. He was very. He was kind of recruited highly. He was highly recruited by a lot of big schools. Um, LSU did not recruit him. Uh, they recruited him, but they didn't come after him. They just very, very casual, kind of uninterested in it, and maybe didn't feel he was good enough. I don't know. But I was not going to pursue him and push him to come to LSU. You know. So I didn't, you know, so he went down to Miami, kind of like his dad. He went down to Miami. I went down there with him. Uh, they, Miami got a little recruiting ploy they used. They take those guys on down to the nude beach. So Miami does it a little different. So they took that group that they had, a, he had a group of about 12 guys with him that we all went down and they walked down to the little nude beach and then, oh yeah, I'm coming to Miami. So he went back, I'm coming to Miami, the hell you are. You ain't coming to Miami for the new beach, you know. I said, you might be coming to Miami, but you're coming on spring break, you know. So anyway, uh, it was just phenomenal. We went down to Miami. We did that. He wanted to commit. I wouldn't let him. And I said, no, you've got to take, uh, you got to go visit the other four or five school we talked about, which uh, the four or five was Notre Dame, uh, Ohio State, USC, uh, Miami was one. Yeah, Miami was one. And if LSU offered, it was going to be one. So I said, no, you're not committing. This is the first school. You're not committing. You know, we're going to go back and check this out, check that out. You know? So I said, no, we're not doing it. You know, you're not committing for that reason. And uh, i never forget that was on a, uh, we went down and visited him on a Friday. Uh, boom. He left and went back home, Cleveland, Ohio, because I was uh, with the Browns at the time. Then I left from there and went to the senior boat. So I had to go over to Mobile. So I left from there and went straight to Mobile. And then I... <laughs> I never forget Monday morning. I'm in Mobile, Alabama. My wife called me. She said, "You expecting some guy here?" I said, "No." She says, "A guy just pulled up in a big old, big old Cadillac, got a three-piece suit on, looks sharp as hell." And uh, I said, God, I can't figure out who this guy is. Huh? And I said, "What color car is it?" She said, "It's a big old, like a gray, like a silver." I said, "Oh, that's Coach Tressel, the head coach of High State." She said, "Nah, this ain't no head coach. This guy's good looking and..." Dress yeah, shawl, head coach. Head coach, yeah. coach yeah. And I said, oh, okay, all right. I said, all right, well, keep me on the speakerphone. Let me hear what he says. Ring the doorbell, she opened the door. She said, hi, I'm Jim Trussell from Ohio State. And she said, you are a head coach. <laughs> Terry, it is the head coach. Come on in, coach. And Coach Trussell went and sat at the table with my wife, and that was it. I said, my son ain't visiting nobody else. He ain't talking to nobody else. So she wasn't letting him go nowhere else. She said, you going to Ohio State? And Coach Tressel came and rung that doorbell, and uh, it was unbelievable the things he said to my wife. It was unbelievable the way he recruited. We went down to visit, and it was over. And um, I told my son, I said, the only thing I can tell you, I know a thousand percent, because I've been there. I said, you come to Ohio State as a boy, you're going to leave as a man. Mm -hmm. I said, and I promise you one thing, when you leave this campus, you'll be more prepared for the world than your daddy ever was. I said, this campus produced men. I said, and uh, you got the right guy to do it. And uh, he went there and uh, I told him I wanted him to, I wanted him the gray shirt first. Then I told him I wanted him the red shirt. I didn't want him to play. And I said, I wanted him to have a full five year ride in college and have fun and experience college football and college life. And I wanted him to experience that at a high level. But he was there for about two weeks and uh, three weeks or four weeks into it, they decided he was the third best receiver. He had to play, and they thought, Terry, this guy could help us win the national championship. I need him, you gotta play. And they played him, and they went to the national championship, and then Florida beat him. And then the next year or so, they went to the national championship, and they went to New Orleans, and they came out into New Orleans, and unless you beat him, unless you beat him, you know. So uh, he, he played. Uh, from that, he ended up getting drafted by the Cleveland Browns, which is the place I had worked. So I think he was the second or third pick of the second round with the Cleveland Browns. And, uh, you know, fortunate for him, I think he played six years. Uh, the greatness of it was uh, his tight end, wide receiver, wide receiver. Play wide receiver. Uh, you know, his, uh, his fifth year, I think his fifth year in the league, uh, we needed a guy in Atlanta. Uh, he had just got cut, we signed him, and he came to play for me, you know, so. Uh, well, that's interesting. Yeah, so I had the great fortune of coaching, uh, coaching my son, you know, coaching my son. and. Uh, it was awesome. I had a great time. We had a lot of fun. 
And uh, anyway, a lot of pain, a lot of aches because I didn't coach him no different than anybody else. I coach all my kids like my son, you know. But like I told him, you know, hey, I don't have to choke your ass. I can go home and choke your wife. I mean, my wife, <laughs> your mama. I can go home and choke your mama. So, you know what I mean? That was, uh, it was fun. I had a good time with it. And, uh, but I'm happy he had that great experience. Um, I don't think he, uh, he, he was a very talented kid, you know. But I, I always told him he was soft. I, I, and I don't, I don't coach anybody. You know, I don't coach anybody that's soft. You know what I mean? But I just... I just thought the way he played, he played college football. And when he came to the pros, he didn't he didn't change who he, he was. Make that he didn't make that adjustment. You know, he, he never got nasty. Yeah. So he, 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 Plus he, he didn't play special. He should go ahead right about now. Right about now. Yeah, right about now. He'd be having a blast, you know what I mean? Because he could do all that other stuff, you know, catch his one hand behind his back and do all that, you know, but not worry about getting hit, huh? Yeah, you know, not not not, not worry at all today, you know. But he did good, he had a great experience, it was fantastic for him. But I tell every kid, I, every kid I ever coach, every kid I ever been around, I tell them all the same. And you know what's funny about it? I'm down in Miami. I was with the Dolphins, and I lived in Miami all season. I'm down in Miami, and I'm riding my bike. Uh, I ride from my house to the beach, which is two miles. And I'm living down in Miami. I'm living on the water, and, and, and I love water. And I ride my bicycle, and as I'm riding, I see a guy coming. I'm going south, and I see a guy coming running on the street north. Guys got on some nice shorts and no shirt. Well built young man, running man. And then all of a sudden I realized he's running across the street, running right at me. And you know, some crazy people in the world today, you know. So I stopped and go, go, get off that bike, brace myself up. This guy gonna jump on me, you know. Guy run over, hey coach, man, what's up, what's up, what's up, what's up, you know. And I'm like, wait a minute now. I know you found me. Coach, I'm job with Landry. Oh, hell, it's you guys. Hell, it's you guys, you know. <laughs> so he called, man, gave me the biggest hug, man. He and there chatted and talked. And uh, I stood there with Jarvis, man. And I was so uh, I was so thrilled that he recognized me. And his, he talked about how his family uh, talked about me. And Coach, you the man, man. And it was great. And, uh, you know, and to hear guys like that, guys talk about how growing up as a kid, they wore my jersey. They had my LSU jersey on his front of them, you know. But I never forget sitting up there and me and him standing there talking for about a half an hour, hour. We stood up, talked, talked, talked. On the side of the room. On just on the side of the, 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 the street, uh, you know, going out to the beach. And he had run down the beach and back. And I was just going to ride my bicycle, you know. But getting back to what I was saying, saying that I told my son, I tell everybody, you know, hey man, always keep in mind, there is life after football. There is life after football. You're never too old. You're never too old to start another career and start another business. Don't ever, ever forget that. I said, so keep in mind, you're in the game. It's a tough game to stay in. Get in it, make your money, have a good time. It's gonna hurt you when you get out. I said, but feel the pain and then let that pain go. Cause you gotta go to that next career with the same energy, the same enthusiasm, the same desires that you have in football. I'm going into it to win. You go into it to kick ass. I said, so whatever you decide you're going to do next, go do it 100 miles an hour. Be prepared to go kick ass the way you do it now. I said, but just let this be a stepping stone to your next career. Whatever that next career is, you don't know what it is. God can bring it to you. But whatever it is, let this be a stepping stone to your next career. Just go after it with the same passion. You're going to be all right. I tell that to everybody. But that, that's the power. For I tell that to everybody. Yeah, they got to close with that. Man. I, that I leave that on the table. That's good. That's that, good. that is a powerful. I mean, once yes. again, we have the great, the legendary Coach Terry Robiski here today who came in to share. Uh, and we've been talking for several months now, so we finally got a chance to sit down and, and hear and uh, the heartfelt truth. And this brother always has spoke from the heart. I don't know where he got him, how he dealt it, but then he always spoken from the heart. We miss him at LSU because he didn't come around. In the first two years, he came around quite mm -hmm. a bit. Yeah. After that, we didn't see you right. anymore because he started coaching pro, uh -huh. pro football right. after that. And right. it's, probably my, it's probably my first time seeing you in right. 30 years, yes. I guess, huh? Yes. And, uh, in a long time. And, I, and I'm really honored that you took the time to come and be on Count Time and to, to share your story, your history, 
you know, your life, and that just means so, so much to us. And man, I just say thank you for being here today. I'm happy you called me, uh, and I'm happy we, like you said, is we've talked about it. You know, Laura called me, and we talked about getting together and doing it. I had no idea when I would be back here to do it. Uh, when Laura first called me, I thought it was something we were going to be doing over the telephone, right. you know. And then when you said, no, man, I want to do this in person, I said, well, I don't know when I'm going to get back. But, uh, you know, I said I was going to make it a point to get back. And, uh, you did, you see, you and then, like I said to you, um, I had no plan of being here to now, this week, you know. And I knew I was going to come to Laura's deal because Laura's deal in my heart. That's another guy that trained me in college. And he's very, very dear, just like Laura and Dolan and all those first Mike Williams. Those guys are very, very dear to me because those guys opened that door for me, you know. And uh, I had to come back, and I knew I was coming back to Rob's thing. And I thought, wow, what, 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 what better timing? Uh, I can now go back and go do this with Lyme and get this, get this thing done for him. And uh, like I said, man, you know, uh, I, I've had the great opportunity. God has taken me to a lot of places. A lot of people in the world has touched me, you know. And if, if one day I'm gonna do a movie, you know, and, and, and I do things like that people people sitting down and what make this guy with this body think this, you know? <laughs> if people if if, if if somebody ever opened up a TV camera and looked at my life and my world and my travel, people start to say, Are you kidding me? You know, what where, where does this come from? You know? So uh, coming out, coming out of know, Agar. Out of Agar, Louisiana, you know, and, and I and I'll tell you, man, if you and I just want you to keep that in mind. If people think I'm I'm, I'm joking with a man, but if you if you if you happen to be walking the street in Atlanta, Georgia, and you see a guy named Jews Irvin, say, "Hey, man, Terry Biscuit sent me. Watch him hug you." <laughs> you go to San Francisco, you see a guy named What you want to eat, man? You go you go to Carmel, California, you see a guy named Reggie Jackson. Just October. You say, hey, "Man, Terry Biscuit sent me." You need a place to stay. You need baseball yeah. player. Yeah, baseball. Not, not just football. Basketball. I'm, that's what I'm telling you. You, you, build, you build relationships. I build relationships, man. You touch the lives of people. Listen, man, I got pictures in my phone. I can show you right now. I had dinner a couple of months ago with a guy named Jim Brown. I had dinner a year or two ago with a guy named Bill Russell. Who did they pass? I'm just telling you, man. It's just, uh, I tell people all the time when I die, don't cry. <laughs> uh, oh, I've lived the life of many, many kings. Ooh. Many, many kings. I want to have one queen, Cynthia. Uh, I want to have one queen, Cynthia. But I've lived the life of many, many kings, bro. If you if you can name their name, I know they know me. They know Terry Biscay. They respect me. They love me. I do too. And that's, like, that's something to be proud of. I'm proud, I'm proud of you. To come from where I came from and to be able to have them people, have them people speak your name and stand up for you, I'm, I'm proud of you. And, and uh, you know, I hate the fact that my mom and dad ain't, ain't here today to see the finished product, and, yeah. but like I said, I ain't finished yet. You still, you still ain't the finished product. I ain't finished yet. Yeah, I ain't finished yet. But, but just think about it. So, so when, when that book coming out, that movie coming out, when, when is it? I tell you, uh, uh, people call me all the time. People call me all the time. I got two, three people that I'm in discussions with today about uh, about doing a movie. Uh, one guy's a guy named Watch. I share a smaller world. One guy's a guy named Harold Sylvester. If you go look Harold up. Harold was the first basketball player in Tulane history. First black basketball player in the history of Tulane. I think Harold went to Tulane the year before College Temple came to LSU. His name is Harold Sylvester, big time actor, go look him up. He called me when I got to LA. Come on man, we'll do a movie, I'm doing your story. And me and Harold sit down and talk. When I went to LSU on a recruiting trip, Harold was my host. He took me out and showed me around. And now he's in LA and uh, he wants to do a story on me. And uh, we talked about doing one today. I've got four or five people that have called me about doing a book. Uh, I don't know about doing a book uh, because I told them for me to do a book and that book to sell, I've got to tell a lot of stories and I've got to give a lot of dirt to a lot of people, you know. And uh, like I told them, I'd have to tell more stories about me and Edward Edwards to get that book to sell, <laughs> to get that book to sell. And I'm not sure I want to do that, you know. But then I know I'm really looking to get shot, you know what I mean? So I don't know. You know, one day I might, one day I might do a book. I'm not sure. Uh, I'm definitely thinking I'm somewhere and I'm gonna do a movie. Uh, I'm gonna probably end up doing a movie because I just think, I, I just think that when uh, I open my eyes and look at my life and view it in a viewfinder, it excites me. 
So, you know, I just... Because you get excited, everybody got to get excited, I just, think, I, I just think it's a phenomenal story, you know. And, and let me let me say this while I'm sitting there talking to you. I'll show you a picture in a minute, and I'll tell all your fans who sit down and listen. You know, people you know, people always think, like I just told you, I tell my players all the time, and I can't tell it to them and teach it to them and preach it to them if I don't know it and I don't believe it, you know. Uh, there's life after football. You know, I've done football, like I said, for... You know, for a long time, I'm 68 years old, you know. Two years ago, I started a company. You won't believe it. Two years ago, I started a company. I took a, I took an LSU, I took an LSU football helmet, and I made a coffee maker. This is... It's unbelievable. It's a coffee maker. And, a uh, coffee maker? It's a coffee maker. Oh, I just realized it's, it's a coffee, coffee maker. maker. You open up the top of it. You open up the top of it. You drop a pot in, pour a cup of water, close it. I got a face mask with a shield on it. You raise it up, you put a cup inside, you close it, press the button, and in 60 seconds you got a hot cup of coffee. I took a football helmet and I put all the all the inside, all the ingredients, all everything inside of it, like here. And it's unbelievable and uh, it's it's selling like hot cake. I came out here about two, three months ago. I went down to Tippetoe, Louisiana, and I met and visited with uh, uh, the people out at uh, Rouse's. And I tried to get Donnie Rouse. I knew Donnie Rouse's grandfather, and I met him through Mr. Pelche. But I didn't know Donnie Rouse. And I guess I don't know him well enough because he told me no, he didn't want to take my LSU helmets. But um, I, I, I'm selling them. Uh, if you go to, uh, uh, on the website and look at them, Ohio State's got them in the bookstores. We sell them to Born and Nobles. We sell them to Ohio State. We got a deal going with Michigan. We got a deal with. Uh, so you make for all universities. I'm making them for all universities. No, 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 and, no. and let me tell you one last story. We're, we're so hot with these coffee making helmets that I took an LSU helmet with. We're going on Shark Tank, Shark Tank call. I'm going on Shark Tank, do a show on Shark 68, Tank. 68, you still going I'm strong. I'm still going strong. I keep rolling, so, man. I keep so rolling. So you keep reading, re 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 I keep reading re myself. I keep reading re myself. And that, that's exciting. It's exciting. I love it. Because life, you still got a lot of life. I got a lot of life, bro. And I hope to have that kind of life when I'm dead. I just keep going. <laughs> I just keep going, life. bro. Have that kind of life in your day. Yeah, bro. I just, want, I just keep going, bro. But, but how, keep going. how do they get to the web page or... What do, what do, what do. I'm still getting my website all set up. I'm trying to get it all set up, but the uh, company is EHB. It's EHB. 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 Coffee helmet maker. EHB e coffee helmet maker. Yes. So, so now, now, you were just sitting down one day and that hit you, or you talking to somebody? No, we were sitting down in the garage, right? And you know, uh, football. You, you know yourself. You're always moving and packing boxes and going and going. Oh, so we're sitting down and you know, it's like five or six helmets. This helmet was cracked, so I took it. And this guy broke this face mask, went in there, broke my face mask, the Raiders. So I got it. So I've got ten helmets up there, all these broke, old broke ass helmets. Man, there gotta be something you can do with them, you know. And we just sit there, and you know, one of my partners, guy, just sat out there and said, you know, hey man, I think that thing, we can take that thing, and design that thing, we can make a coffee maker out of that. I think that would really, really sell. So we just took it and got, and got one made. And then right off the bat, I took it to Jim Trestle. Again, I was in Cleveland, so I took it to Jim Trestle. And I can't remember, I tell people, I can't remember Coach Stressor saying, this is unbelievable. Man, make me a hundred of a thousand. Make me, I, I got to have it. Make two thousand. I need them. Make them. Man. I'm going to give them to my niece and my nephew and my cousin. The dude was so excited, man, when he saw the one we made, which was the Ohio State one. He was so excited, man, and so pumped. He told me to make them. I said, I can't make them. I don't have no license. He said, no, no, you make them. I got the license. I said, I can't. I can't go producing stuff for the college. I don't have a license. And he says, no, 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 don't worry about it. I'm, I'm going to get that. I'm going to get I'm gonna get the license. I'm going to get the license. And then he called the AD. And he come here. I need to show you something. And then the AD came in and he said, yeah, go ahead. You can make those. Yeah, we're going to get it. Yeah, we're going to make We're going to get it. Yeah. So we went out and made 4,000 of them. So now what about the LSU? I had one that I made, which was the LSU one. I had one I made. I made a sample of it. And then uh, my, my aunt took it. She said, no, no, no. I want this and I want that. <laughs> so we took it. So then when we decided to come down to Rouse's to, 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 to try to get them to buy it, I went down to Rouse's and I gave Rouse uh, the only ones I had. I had a copy of the Ohio State ones. So I gave it to him. I said, you know, we can do this. We're going to do them in LSU. LSU be one we can do. And uh, I said, but I need to find out. Would you guys be interested in, you know, doing business with me? You know? And they said, no. Rouse, the, Rouse told me no. You did the red for Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Well, we got to make that happen, then, huh? Oh, man. That's, that's, that's almost the size of a real hammer, too. It is real hammer. It is a real.